see you, uh, Sarah Beth Coughlin. At this point, uh, let me, well, I'll introduce the councils in a second. Let me start off by saying, someone asked me yesterday, why do I chair the community today? I say because we have council rules. People don't realize that, but we have council rules. And one of the rules that we have, excuse me, one of the rules that we have is the councilor from the district where the nominee resides, resides over that hearing. And you live in my district, so I preside over the hearing. That's that. Uh, the hearing will start. Another thing, another council rule that we have is our formal meeting starts at 12 noon. And it's the governor who sets the date, time, and place of our formal assembly. That's a council rule. There are many more council rules, but that's for another day. So if the lieutenant governor comes in, 12 o'clock, we will immediately suspend, and we will continue after the formal assembly. Yeah. Okay? So at this point, I know you have a lot of distinguished people who want to speak on your behalf, so we'll hear from them first, the people who are live, in person. But another council rule that we have is that if people want to appear by Zoom or WebEx, we allow that. So if anyone wants to speak in favor or in opposition, that's a council rule that we allow that to happen. Having said that, anyone who wants to speak in opposition, if they're live, will speak uh, in person in opposition. And if they want to speak on through WebEx or Zoom, we will allow that also. So I just wanted to set uh, how the meeting will operate, and I, I always like to follow the council rules. The last council rule that we have that pertains to this here, okay, each councillor has 15 minutes to ask questions of the nominee. I will keep the time, and after 15 minutes, and do, uh, because we have to respect all councillors, uh, I will have to tell them the question is over. Another council rule that we have is, I'm in District 4, so everyone, the first person to the right of me, which is Councillor Duff, she goes first, then it's Kennedy, then it's DePaulo, we go that way. So I just wanted to set the ground rules uh, and make sure you understand the council rules that we have in place. Okay? Having said that, at this point, I think I have your witness list. Uh, let's, let's hear from them first. Attorney Tim Foley. You can, uh, Attorney Foley, you have two choices. You can either stand or sit. I'll sit here. Uh, of course. Here, I know. Starting right off. Good morning, Chair Ryan Eller, members of the Commoners Council. For the record, my name is Timothy Foley, as you heard. It's an honor and a privilege to speak to you this morning concerning the advice and consent of Governor Haley's appointment of Sarah B. Coughlin to the Massachusetts Parole Board, which includes appointment to the Advisory Board of not only is Sarah Coughlin's resume impressive, which I'm sure you've had time to review, but to watch Sarah professionally interact with the range of diverse clientele and connect effortlessly on a path to, to healing in a skill that can only be gleaned from such vast experience. In looking at um, resume 2002, one of the first entries there, she spent the summer, junior summer, junior year of um, Providence College, her summer at the Dominican Republic, working at a boys' outreach program and orphanage, helping teaching English in ways to become self-sufficient. So, all the way back to 2002 to get where we are today, the experience. Sarah Coughlin is intelligent, driven, organized, is an organizer. She is resourceful, empathetic. However, Sarah's experience with the criminal justice system incarceration, restorative justice, and in particular returning citizens, has given her an inside look at different levels of rehabilitation. And therefore, has the, she has the skill and instinct to recognize when one's release is not compatible with the safety and welfare of society. Because of the Massachusetts Supreme Court decision in Dechenko, which held that a life sentence without possibility of parole concerning juvenile defenders, um, and there are rumors that the Chanko decision could be expanded to 20 year old offenders. Sarah Coughlin's qualifications as a licensed independent social worker will be vital to the parole board in the evaluations of petitions concerning the issue of adolescent brain development, the effects of childhood trauma, and other mental health issues, especially when expert witnesses are involved. 
I, um, I first met, um, going off my writing, I wanted to just, um, just briefly, I've worked with Sarah on three cases. Um, one was, as you, this board is very aware of, is the Thomas Coons case. I brought Sarah, Coon, Sarah Coughlin in um, at the, when we went to prepare for the parole hearing. Her, her experience, her um, way about her, the way she was interacting with Mr. Coons, it was invaluable to prepare him for his transition into the community, which as we've seen now a year and a half later has been seamless. Beyond that, um, we, I, I had another parole hearing, uh, parole candidate who was a life of parole hearing who, this gentleman was, um, you know, was the, was the opposite of Mr. Coons. He may have served the toughest time in the last probably 50 years. He did 20 years in solitary confinement. He, um, he was sent to Leavenworth when he was 22 years old, federal prison. This was a real convict. I brought this, uh, Sarah Coughlin came in probably about five or six months prior to the eventual um, parole hearing. We, we prepared, we talked, we got to causative factors. Sarah was able to talk to this gentleman on a level and bring him to a level of rehabilitation. It was always inside him, but she was able to bring it out of him. And not only, and we, he was unanimously paroled. And then from there, um, he went to a, a halfway house in which Sarah Coughlin for the next six months met with him every Thursday for at least an hour to make sure that that preparation and that parole was going right and his transition was going correct, which it was, but unfortunately, he had some heart issues and he, um, he passed away, which is very unfortunate after doing the 48 years. But I can tell you that the dedication and the know-how and the expertise of Sarah was amazing and it could have been done without her. Brings me to the last client that I had just recently with Sarah. That client, um, we were actually at the memorial service for the gentleman who I just talked about. I saw Sarah there. I had been working for two months to try to find a dual diagnosis program for a client of mine. I saw Sarah there and a light bulb went off. I bet you Sarah can help me find a dual diagnosis program. That was a Sunday. On Wednesday, the paperwork was sent to the jail from the program. A client was admitted to the program that Friday. And for two months, I had tried to get this gentleman into a program. It was it, her, her tireless efforts, her on the phone all day, every day, trying three or four different programs. Then the gentleman is doing well and he's in the community now. That was only about probably two or three months ago. So having stated that, I would just say that to the, to the council, um, given Sarah's experience, her education, her ability, and, and I know that she works in, um, in the restorative justice field, which if anybody is not familiar with that, it's working with the trauma, with the victims, with the causative factors, with the um, what got persons to where they are on parole, I mean, in, incarcerated, and then looking for parole. Sarah is certainly a person that would protect the public safety of this of the uh, Commonwealth, knowing when somebody has done the work to be paroled and when somebody has not done the work to be paroled. And I would ask you to um, accept the nomination of Sarah Coffin to the parole board. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor uh, Delaney. Pleasure to see you again, Tim. Oh, nice uh, to see you, Tim. People to know that Tim was responsible for Thomas getting his commutation before the council. And, um, and I visited Thomas out in the prison and I cried in the car because such a travesty of justice for black men who go before white jurors. And I, it has to change and I'll keep fighting for it. And here's someone who's fighting for it and she is too. So tell me, what attribute, could you think of one adjective that you would say that she brings, that Sarah brings to the parole board? I would say, well, I think, there's a lot to say, but I would say her work ethic and her expertise in the field of rehabilitation is two. I can't, they're both level and they're both at 100% in my opinion. Scale of one to 10 or, or 100%, whatever you wanna say, she's a 10. Well, I have to tell you, Tim, uh, when I first got elected, there were all prosecutors on the parole board. And I knew this was wrong and I investigated and found it wasn't in compliance for diversity 30 years since Governor Dukakis. So we worked on that. And uh, this, I, I don't have a poker face, and I'm saying it already. Uh, I've been waiting 24 years for Sarah. <laughs> because um, she, slot, we need a social worker. And we have a forensic specialist, 
Charlene Bonner, and three of them on the floor I voted for because they're all qualified and experienced, and she's going to learn from them, and they're going to learn from her. And unfortunately, we had a wonderful forensic um, specialist who had to retire because of health, and um, she was Charlene Bonner's teacher as a forensic. So um, you, you don't know how welcome we are because we were short. And having you speak, you, you couldn't have a better, better spokesman, really. And um, it, because I know him personally and work with him with uh, about Tom. And even went out when you coach the kids, I went out to the game. <laughs> but um, but anyway, thank you for taking your time, Tim. And uh, your uh, your testimony really means a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor Kennedy. Tim, it's good to see you. Nice to see you too. We echo uh, what Councilor Devaney said in terms of the hard work you put into that to the Coombs case. Uh, you got the First commutation, I think, in 30 years for somebody on a first degree. How's he doing? He's doing very well. He's working with the team empowerment group. He's um, out there every day doing well. He was at, I saw actually on uh, Facebook, believe it or not, he was at a, um, a street workers conference yesterday down at Foxborough, and he's around. He's doing very well. He did a fantastic job. And, and I have to tell you that uh, your testimony certainly means a lot to everybody here. When, comes to somebody for a parole nomination because we know how hard you work on those issues all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, <laughs> how many weeks did you say that prisoner was in solitary confinement? Twenty. Massachusetts? Yes. Yes. It was a it's a, it was really a rather not and <laughs> But, I'm fine you answer the question. Thank you. No, I, I don't mean to, but it's a really interesting story, and it was a really interesting um, whole hearing. And well, something very uh, enthusiastic about. It. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Before we uh, get to the next witness, I would like to read a letter dated August 31st, addressed to the council. Dear councilors, pursuant to the provisions of Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 27. Section four, I'm pleased to nominate Sarah B. Coughlin for appointment to the position of the parole board. <laughs> Sincerely, Mara Healy, governor. At this point, we'll hear from uh, your next witness, Charlene Boomer from the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you to members of the governor's council for allowing me to speak before you today. My name is Charlene Luma. I'm a clinical forensic social worker who has been in the field for nearly 20 years. I have the pleasure of knowing Sarah Coughlin for most of my career. We worked together over the years in various capacities as clinical social workers, always serving the most vulnerable and high risk young adults and youth in the city of Boston. From the time I've encountered Sarah, she's impressed upon me the qualities that most social workers aspire to be. She's a fierce advocate. She's clinically sound, a tremendous colleague, a hard worker, and someone who understands the complexities of diverse populations, trauma, and systems have in vulnerable populations. In our work together over the years, we often have encountered individuals who have multiple system involvement, live in communities that were impacted by violence, poverty, substance use and economic inequity. The individuals we work with by far have experienced the most difficult challenges one can face and, and, and require interventions and support from a macro, micro and clinical perspective. Sarah is someone who's done all of those things through her legislation, um, advocacy with legislation, policy development, serving on boards, offering pro bono, pro bono therapeutic services and working with systems to develop programs that directly change the trajectory of youth and adults across our state. In social work, we often use the term meeting people where they are at. Sarah has embodied this throughout her career, in particular in her work with victims and those impacted by trauma and violence. Meeting someone where they are at means understanding that there are many layers to that person and committing to giving them voice. Sarah has done that every single day of her career. She has worked to ensure that victims have equitable access to treatment, education, mental health services, housing, transportation, and services that empower them to navigate their journey as they heal. 
Sarah has dedicated her career to working within the criminal justice system. Her work and reputation speak for itself. I can think of no one better suited to serve on this board. She has high integrity, is well respected by clients, victims, law enforcement, the community, and those in various systems. That's well represented in this room today. With Sarah, you get a nice balance of accountability. Someone who is not afraid to challenge others, someone who is a staunch collaborator, and someone who understands the complexities of systems, substance use, mental health, trauma, victimization, and the carceral institutions. I could not be more proud of her and what she will offer to this board and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I ask that you accept her nomination today. I will ask also just add that, um, you know, I, like I said, I've known Sarah for nearly 20 years of our career and we've worked in various capacities. And Sarah is, is someone who just doesn't give up. She's fierce, she's resilient. Um, she fights for what's right all the time, even when it's hard to make that decision. She's always on the side of what's right. And so um, I'm just really proud of her and what she's done and what she will continue to do. She has a lot to offer you. Um, and I'm just hoping that you accept the nomination. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Councilor Devane. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, you're, it was very heartfelt. Uh, you're chief. I am chief of staff. I'm also a commission on the post. Now, I want to ask you, is there any particular case that stands out that really impressed you about Sarah? Yes, and so um, this was years ago. Um, you know, the individuals we work with are very complex. This individual was a gang involved young person um, who, um, you know, unfortunately, the clients we work with are at high risk. Um, and the people who do this work, including myself, Sarah, have lost many clients to homicide. And there was an incident uh, where, unfortunately, um, there was a violent occurrence in front of Sarah and this individual client. So in that moment, um, if you can imagine seeing something like that and being the clinician and having your client next to you, both of you are experiencing this and you have to kind of do a couple things in that moment. You have to make sure that you remain calm, but you also have to kind of um, almost check your own reaction so you can make sure you're prioritizing the reaction of the client. And then you have to deal with the aftermath of that. Um, I can't imagine being in that situation and circumstance. Sarah went on to do amazing work with that individual client, but to be in that circumstance is not typical. It's not normal. And Sarah handled it with such grace and integrity um, and was able to give that client what that client not only needed in that moment, but in the future. So that's something that really stands out to me. Um, and I don't think many clinicians could um, respond in the way that she did, in a way that was healthy and really enhanced the relationship and allowed the relationship to continue. Yeah, that's outstanding. So how long have you known? Uh, almost 20 years. Yeah. Uh, we, we came in in the field. I've seen a lot of her cases. I've seen a lot. We've worked in various capacities together. Um, we've done groups together. We've worked in different organizations together. Um, we've um, collaborated on workshops. We've collaborated on um, supporting other social workers coming to the field. Um, so we, we've done a lot together and I'm a staunch supporter of hers. Well, your testimony means a lot to me. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Armand Coleman from the Transformational Prison Project. Well, good morning, counselors, and thank you for having me today and allow me to testify. I want to first say that I'm kind of nervous, um, not because I have to speak, but because they made me write it down. And I'm not used to writing down. I'm just speaking from the heart, from the cuff. So um, please allow me a moment to introduce myself. My name is Armand Coleman, and I am the executive director of the Transformation of Prison Project. We are a restorative justice organization founded for and by incarcerated people. I myself am formerly incarcerated and currently on lifetime parole. Having been sentenced to life at the age of 17, I served more than 28 years in the Massachusetts Department of Corrections with more than a decade in solitary confinement before being paroled in the year 2019. 
It was in 2019 that I first met Sarah Coughlin. I was able to witness the great work that she was doing with teenagers at Turning Around Charlestown. Town. At that time, I realized that the support that she was providing to the youth there could have benefited myself as a teenager. And that if I had the kind of support that she was providing at that time, I myself would have had a different trajectory and my life would have been much different. During the first year of my reentry, Sarah Coughlin was a critical source of support. She helped me to find community. Um, she helped me to understand and navigate the anxiety and stressors associated with reentry after long term incarceration. She told me to have compassion for myself while also welcoming me to participate in whole restorative justice circles with the youth. Her support helped me to become the leader I am today. Two years after my release, I would establish the Transformation of Prison Project. Sarah Coughlin would join us and serve as our director of the Wellness and Restoration Center, working closely with myself and the formerly incarcerated leadership of the Transformation of Prison Project. We were able to create several programs to serve formerly and currently incarcerated individuals. Sarah Coughlin was and is trained in restorative justice practices by way of our phase training program and was thus able to administer and assure via her team clinical services that are restorative justice in nature and consistent with our, with our, with our processes. Um, TPP has something we would call the Youthful Offender Group, which serves parolees and life first sentence to life as teenagers. This program was, stab was established under the Wellness and Restoration Department, which was led by Sarah Coughlin. Um, Sarah Coughlin also helped us shape and give life to our first of its kind um, fellowship program for formerly incarcerated people. I say all this to say that I realize how critical, I, I say all this to say that I realize how critical she was with my reentry journey. So we created dynamic programming to make the same available to others faced with reentry. One thing I would like to say about Sarah before I end is that she understands incarceration its effects and its impacts because she knows and understands how incarceration impacts people's reentry. Um, I'm not only here to support her in that, but I'm supporting her because I know that if Sarah Coughlin is appointed to the parole board, um, she will be the people's parole board member. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilor uh, Devaney. Thank you. Your, your testimony is very valuable. And I have said it publicly, I would like to see someone who, like yourself, has, has been incarcerated and has gone on with your life and has done good things to be on the parole board, because I think it would give an incentive to, um, to people that, you know, what could be done with your life. And um, so um, tell me uh, about that. How, how much involvement did she have uh, with the program that you're involved in? Um, so, well, uh, most people who come home with lifers are, are mandated to have mental health services. Some of these mental health services, I mean, none of these mental health services are tailored for formerly incarcerated people. And we realized that um, long-term incarceration, even short-term incarceration, um, is a mental barrier that, that prevents people from successfully re-entering. And Sarah Coughlin was instrumental um, in single-handedly establishing a clinic um, that we were able to like bring in clinicians, one of whom were formerly incarcerated, others that had experience in the carceral system that we respected and developed and developed the type of um, mental health programming that we all needed. Yeah. So anybody that was in our programming were able to get mental health services that were sort of the major. That's great. Uh, you don't think of a social worker doing the work that she has done. You don't hear it. That's not the average social worker getting involved with incarcerated and, and young people and everything. So, um, but I'm very impressed and um, congratulations and thank you for all you do and all you serve. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Question? Oh, please. My name. Councilor uh, DePaulo. Thank you, Councilor. Good morning. Thank you for being here and thank you for your work with TPP uh, as well. Um, I want to ask you about something that I suspect I'll talk with the nominee about um, when it's time to talk to her, and that is um, the programming uh, during incarceration. You talked a little bit about post incarceration and the needs for services to support reentry. Um, the parole board is seeing people who are presently incarcerated, and oftentimes they're looking at what programming they've taken 
uh, uh, advantage of in, in their time. And however, um, my understanding, strike that my knowledge, is that there's inadequate programming available in the first place. So the folks who are incarcerated um, who may be seeking uh, restorative justice programs, might be seeking education programs, might be seeking workforce training programs, are unable to access it. And then they appear before the parole board. And one factor to look at is what have you been doing while you're incarcerated? And sometimes the list is, is light. And it's not because the person hasn't attempted to pursue some of those options. Is that an accurate representation? Could you speak to that, your knowledge of, of, uh, of the experience of the incarcerated population? Yes, yes, I can speak very well to that. So um, I spent 28 years incarcerated, as I said. Um, I spent 20 years in the most intensive, um, dangerous environment that the Massachusetts Department has to offer. And like you said, the only programming that was available to me was minimal, um, probably Toastmasters, AA, and probably one or two others, ABP. Um, however, in, in 2000 and... I, I'm sorry, could I pause? What were the two you just named two um, programs? Um, Alcoholics Anonymous, okay. AA, and Toastmasters International, which is a public speaking um, um, program, both of which I actually participated in and actually led. But um, there's no programming to bring healing to what less, leads to people incarceration. It wasn't until we created the Transformation of Prison Project, created programming in MCI Norfolk for the purpose of our own healing that we were able to get programming that was relevant to lifers and people suffering from childhood traumas. Uh, we were under the impression that hurt people hurt people. Yeah. We believe that if people receive the, um, the processing of the trauma they needed, they could actually heal and move on and be productive members of society. And I'm saying that sit before you as a person who was deemed uh, one of the worst of the worst in the Metro's Department of Correction. I went before the Pro Bowl for the first time in 2005. And like you said, because of my limited access to programming, um, in Massachusetts Security Prison, they literally said, you're not doing any programming. I, I, I reiterated there's no programming here. Um, um, but like I said, when I went to Norfolk, we created over different 13 different restorative justice program modules um, that anybody could use to help heal and move forward in life. And those programmings have been referenced by the parole board many times. Is it fair to say that there's a hunger in our institutions for programming and that we're letting people Suffer. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 people I, would, suffer. I, would, I would say definitely so. Um, everybody that I know incarceration, especially those doing long term incarceration, um, none of them wants to come out and do the same thing over and over again. Um, like myself, I didn't get the programming that I needed from sort of justice program, pro programs. Um, I wouldn't be able to get them my own way. Um, I learned that a lot of things I were doing. I was especially, but I was actually reliving crimes and traumas that happened to me as a child. Yeah, it's so true what you said that hurt people hurt people and the corollary that healed people heal people, right? And in my work with, with children dealing with trauma and abuse who are court involved, they're not getting the support they need and they end up on a path where they do end up incarcerated as adults. And when they're in our facilities, they're not getting the, the childhood trauma. The childhood trauma that started it all has still not been addressed, right? It's, it wasn't that long ago that Donald Trump Department of Justice issued a report saying that in Massachusetts, the DOC is violating our uh, incarcerated population civil rights because of lack of access to the Donald Trump Department of Justice. Every time I say that, <laughs> right? Yeah, right, I know it sounds like a, it sounds like a paradox to begin with, but um, uh, it's, it's very alarming, right? And so, um, uh, you know, I hear stories of folks who are incarcerated and the, and the underlying charges stem from, from their childhood. Uh, and I wonder what, what it is we're up to, what, what the goal is. Is the goal to just punish someone into oblivion or is the goal to rehabilitate people? Um, uh, and, and so it troubles me. It troubles me when I, when I think about that. It troubles me when I think about educational institutions having difficulty providing programming that they're offering. Professors offering, begging to get into our institutions and provide programming and being denied. I, I, I understand because, like I said, we started as a restorative justice program. We built a restorative justice programming in the prisons. And like I said, 30 different programs, six different prisons. And to this day, we're fighting to get back into prison, right, post-COVID. Post so um, we are actually a living representation with just that. I think we all want to act in the interest of public safety, and that means getting people better. And so I'm really, it confounds me that we set up barriers to preventing people who want to come in and provide free of charge programming. 
Thank you. Thank you for your time as well. Councilor Duff. I just want to echo what uh, Council Paulo said is I was invited by uh, the Anderson College Prison, Prison Initiative to speak and be in one of their courses. I can't remember which person it was. And I, I, as a member of the Governor's Council, was denied access. They would not let me enter and participate in that education program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Oh, your question. Sorry. Mostly, just want to echo a lot of what's been said already. But can I can I start with just understanding a little better your your project? Is it prison based or is it community after release? Yeah. So the transformation of prison project started as solely uh, prison based prison operating behind the walls. Um, Post COVID, we actually began operating. When I became director, we became operating beyond the wall. Um, and that's some of the things that sir actually helped us do create reentry programming, um, go in operating actually inside and outside. Um, one thing I didn't mention actually is that I had the honor actually working with Sarah um, to do a restorative programming in the South Bay House of Correction. Um, so we actually do that as well, but we do, we work inside the Department of Youth Services. Um, we, work with, we work with higher education and, and we actually work with the jails and prisons when they allow us in, right? When they allow us in. Are you statewide or are you centered? You are statewide. Based in Boston, but we're statewide. Statewide, that's fantastic. I'd love to connect at some point and learn more about the work you're doing. Um, I, I wanna echo what uh, Councilor Devaney said in that I, I very much value your lived experience and your contribution today in this matter, but I, I also believe strongly that we would benefit from having that lived experience represented on the parole board doing the work of the parole board as well. Um, and uh, I kind of want to follow up with, I agree with everything Councilor DePaulo just uh, was asking you about, and those are issues that are very concerning to me as well. Um, rather than repeat it, just sort of to extend it to, I, I've only just begun visiting prisons myself and, and taking the opportunity to actually meet with and hear from incarcerated people in the, in the institutions to hear about their experience. And one of the things, in addition to what Councilor Paula was just saying, um, that I've been hearing is that in our prisons there's a delay in programming access until close to when parole becomes available. So to use language, hopefully not offensive language, but it's like warehousing yeah. for Agreed. years where there could be progress in mental health and substance abuse and education and restorative justice. And the list goes on of what we could be doing, right? They're not getting access. Is that, does that reflect your experience of? Yes, that does. And it also informed our, 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 um, our process, right? So one thing the restorative justice process did in Norfolk when we started was we reversed that polarity that people who were lifers had to make up half of our programming, um, which is amazing because if you look around the room here, a lot of the supporters that are here, which is our, our lifers, and they were the first ones in our program, um, not the short termers, but the lifers, because we felt that the lifers needed it the most, um, like you said, because they were warehoused, and most of them are home now. If they didn't have the opportunity to get that programming 10 years ago, nine years ago, they wouldn't be ready to be out here and be successful with it. Their traumas would have robbed them of their um, reentry, with their reentry, right? And their freedom. Um, we we seen that a long time ago. And because it was led by lifers, we actually made sure that lifers were our priority. I love that. Well, thank you. The only other thing I, I just wanted to ask for, I'm, I'm definitely be asking Sarah soon, but hear from your perspective on is um, the experience of doing whatever you're doing to prepare yourself on on the prison side and then coming before the parole board and hearing what their expectations are of you um how much of a disconnect was that or what you know how much were you prepared for what they're what they were looking for and how much did you have access to do the things that they were looking for right. so so one thing i didn't mention is that the reason why uh, we actually brought sarah coffin on board um, the inspiration of that was that I'm a youthful offender. Um, as a youthful offender, everybody in the Commonwealth, that somebody convicted of a crime under the age of 18, they're entitled to, to social work and other forensic experts to help to prepare for parole. And I saw as a youthful offender how helpful that was to me. Um, so literally bringing her on board was the, was the like, but once you, let me just say something, once you hit the door, that aid and assistant ends. 
So we wanted to create something where people could come home, especially youthful offenders, could actually have somebody like Sarah and her team to continue the, um, the social work services, post incarceration. Um, and not to mention, she actually does, she actually did um, go back inside for us. Like she would help prepare people to prepare for the parole um, using our lived experience to help, help manage their, their, whatever they were dealing with to prepare for the parole. So. Um, everything we did was informed by our processes and, and what, what we needed to be successful. Well, thank you so much for coming out today. I really appreciate the testimony you gave, the experience you've had, and, and hopefully we can connect at some point to talk about your writings. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Katrina Hadley from the Parole Watch. The people who are unfamiliar with the Parole Watch will do an outstanding job. And maybe Katrina, you can tell us a little about your organization. Why? First, I'd like to thank the, uh, the Governor's Council for the opportunity to speak in support of Sarah Coughlin for the Parole Board. My name is Katrina Hadley, and I'm a volunteer with Parole Watch, a group many of you are aware of. Um, parole Watch was formed in 2020 to observe and collect data about the parole review process in order to advocate and advance a more equitable system. We have been to over 200 hearings and we've testified both for and against candidates. With the work of Ertina Hurley and the board, as well as the direction in which we feel the board is going, decisions are now returned more promptly, um, hearings are held without rancor, and we have a higher paroling rate than on previous boards. We feel that Sarah Coughlin would be an excellent addition to the board. Many of our members have come in contact with Sarah through her advocacy work around the criminal legal system reform and through addiction and health services. As her resume shows, without a doubt, she has the background and experience for the position. I'll only highlight a few points as there's so many we feel would make her an invaluable member of the board. Her education and licensure in both social work and drug and alcohol treatment, along with the many years of experience in those areas, as is seen in her leadership role in the National Association of Social Work. Her work with the Committee for Public Council Services and direct experience with developing and coordinating reentry plans, release plans, version programs, and treatment placements show that she understands what is needed to judge parole applicants. Her 10 years of work with the Transitional Prison Project, a restorative justice program, both inside and outside the walls, is invaluable. Many of the incarcerated men and women are very excited about the nomination. I know one friend personally at NEMSI in Norfolk who's extremely excited. In closing, it is clear that she has the experience the knowledge and the compassion to be a wonderful addition to the board. I ask you to support her nomination. We also encourage more nominees as soon as possible, especially nominees of color. Parole Watch has been concerned that the governor did not make recommendations for eight months, even though there have been two vacancies since January 2023. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any uh, Councilor Devaney? I just want to thank you and the Parole Watch. I, I wish you had been here all my 24 years. Uh, dedicated, you go to the Parole Board hearings, you know these uh, people that are coming before us and you testify. And I was with you voting no the last time, but I lost the vote. <laughs> but I want to tell you, uh, I said it before, but we lost a wonderful member because of her health, and she was a forensic specialist. She was heartbroken that she couldn't stay on, so I want you to know that. But, um, you know, we're finally going to have the compliment that we need. So, so tell me, what was the most outstanding attribute that you saw in Sarah? You know, I, I haven't had as much direct exposure. My exposure has been more through talking with men in Norfolk. Um, who actually, I work with another group. Um, we are joint venture, which was created by you know men in Norfolk and she came to the very first event, the small event, and just that sense of being able to show up and show up whether it's a big organization, a small group, 
created completely by incarcerated men. Just and and then I have to say I saw your five page resume and I just <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought she must be 80. <laughs> all that you're doing uh, to volunteer and, and to take all that time. And we listen. And um, thank you for coming. Thank you, Councilor Kennedy. Excuse me. <laughs> um, you've been attending the hearings with the shot in the parole board, fair to say? I've been, excuse me? You've shot three people for some time now. Yes. Yes. That's four people doing the work of seven. Yes. How are those four people doing? It's, I mean, I can imagine their load is unbelievable. And it is, you see it in, you know, many po unscheduled hearings, not as many hearings scheduled for lifers. Um, I mean, we don't get to witness the other hearings that they're having to go to. Um, we've seen, you know, a change in the board, and we've been happy with those for the most part. For for those, um, well, I, I wrote the most recent member when he went through the process. I know that there was some opposition to him. I'm I'm, I'm hearing that he has the highest parole rate of anybody on the board. Have you seen that? I don't know the specifics of his votes. Um, I um, was not a supporter, but he seems to be doing okay, though, huh? It's it's. I know. <laughs> say yes. I I do not think he was a, a stellar addition. Um, the um, but overall the parole board's doing pretty well at this point. I think it's been great improvement. I yeah. think it's it's more in the direction, um, and especially if we. I just want to acknowledge we've been pushing very hard. To get them to fill these slots sooner, but we recognize that it's affecting people's rights, Absolutely. and it's uh, it's keeping people incarcerated longer that would not necessarily be incarcerated. Uh, and we've been uh, on a weekly basis trying to push the administration to move faster with these appointments. I'm certainly very pleased with the, the nominee that's here today, but. Um, uh, I do want to acknowledge the hard work that the people have been on there that have been doing, they've been doing twice as much work, three times as much work as they normally would, and they work pretty hard anyway. So I, I just want to take note of that. That's all. Thank you. So Thank you. Hate to put her on the spot, but the governor's legal counsel is here. And can you give uh, Paige Scott Reader's doing an outstanding job? She's got a lot on her plate, and I understand it. The administration's doing a great job. But you see here this concern about uh, the, the problem of when are we going to fill these vacancies? Could you give us some sense? There's, I believe, two more vacancies we have to fill. Can you give us a sense when one will come and then the next one? So I have been interviewing pretty much nonstop for um, a considerable period of time at this moment. Um, I understand that there's frustration that the um, nominations haven't come faster it's not as easy as um you might think to find the sarah coughlin's of the world and this board is as important to me as anything um i've been asked to do i'm determined that we're going to fill the seats with individuals like sarah coughlin who understand the lived experience of the people who are coming before the parole board and who understand the um, science and um, uh, uh, experiential information we have about what works and what doesn't work and finding people who are willing to do a job that hard um, at the pay rates that we offer and with the kind of criticism that comes at the parole board is just not an easy thing to do. So I'm, I'm asking for all the help I can get if you know people who would fit those criteria and who would be willing to serve, please, please, please have them reach out to me. Thank you. Um, to, excuse me. We are expecting to continue to make recommendations and to bring them before you as quickly as we humanly can. There are some people that I'm interviewing this week that I'm hopeful about, but in, until um, until we're there, I'm not there. So I don't know how to give you a time frame. So is it fair to say that you cannot give us 
and the group here today, you can't give us the commitment, at least at this point, and we know you're doing a great job, that at least one vacancy will be filled within the next 30 days. You cannot give us that commitment. So, so I don't control enough of the variables. I understand, to but able to make can us burn. I can, I can tell you that we will have continued to identify candidates and recommend them over the next 30 days. And I am very much hopeful that you'll have another candidate in front of you, but I, I don't make promises about things that I don't control and I don't. Fair enough. So just to let everyone know, it looks like the board's going to be going to have to be working harder and harder until we get the the right candidates. It, it, who knows? It could be longer than we all want. Uh, Councilor, who had Councilor DePaul? Uh, Councilor, um, Thank you. Councilor DePaul. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you for being here uh, this morning, and or yeah, this morning. And thank you, thank you for the work you do. I've found it valuable in in different areas, and. Um, I just want to note that the fact that we have Chairperson Hurley right now speaks to the fact that this administration has a very different attitude about parole than the prior administration. And um, I'm heartened to hear the outpouring of enthusiasm to get these seats filled this morning in the room. Um, I won't speak for other counselors. I've been recruiting. Uh, a diverse pool of candidates with social work backgrounds and with clinical psychology backgrounds for three years. And I can tell you that um, this governor and her administration and her chief legal counsel, the responsiveness when I'm sending them candidates and the thoughtfulness with which uh, they are approaching this task, I too wish that these seats were filled. And I wish that I could wave a wand and put exactly who I want on there. However, the fact that they are taking their time and I am watching it extremely carefully to the point I am probably irritating people in the administration how often I check in and elsewhere, and elsewhere right? So, you know, I just want to say that I, I do wish it was moving faster, but I do feel like we're, when it happens, we're going to get it right. We got it right today and we're going to get it right two more times. I have 100% confidence in that, and I am very, very happy to hear in this room people talking that way, because I hope that there's other counselors, I know there are other counselors who are out there actively spending time outside of this chamber doing the work of recruiting candidates who have social work backgrounds, who are formerly incarcerated, who bring diverse life experiences um, to the board. and um, and. Again, while I wish it was moving faster or had moved faster, I've seen the thoughtfulness they're putting in. I've seen the way they've approached the interviews with candidates, and I have the utmost confidence that when we get nominees, they're going to be the right nominees, and we're going to be able to move forward um, uh, in a way that I would, I would guess that you and I might agree um, would be the way that we want to see parole moving. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilor Duff. Yeah, I just want to reiterate what Councilor Duff he said is that um, as many people know I've been very vocal that the parole department has been the stepchild of the criminal justice system for way too long and was a depository for a political nepotism way too long and as a result there were so many challenges uh, which I've been incredibly vocal about under the last administration with the board these four people who are there right now have done yeoman's work. Uh, they have cleared up like a year or nine months of a backlog, and they work nonstop. Um, I, I'm, I am surprised, I have to say, because Parole Watch comes here all the time and sends us letters and pieces of paper and things like that, that you are not aware of, of uh, Attorney Kelkos's record. You're not aware of what he's doing and his work there? We don't get the breakdown of how they vote as or I, I'm not aware of it. I'm not, I shouldn't say it. We do have, we're collecting a lot of different pieces. He's considered, just for the record, he is considered the most liberal member of the pro board. He is also, you can dispute it, but these are facts and math doesn't lie. He is also one of the reasons why in the information we were privy to, which I've said many times, we have heard information as counselors that the public and it's not privy to. And one of the things that 
uh, Andrew Kalkulis has done incredibly well is he's an amazing team player, which is something that was desperately needed there. He is the first volunteer for a very unpopular assignment. Um, he is a big man. He's an imposing figure. That matters in some of these prisons and some of the people they're going to see. He is matched up at times when it is determined he needs that is needed for someone's protection. Um, he treats the staff. If you speak to, and I'm not talking about the board members, because the people that interact with me are the staff. You know, the, you know, the guys who've been there since they were 18 years old. They think he's magnificent. He treats them with the utmost respect. Every single thing that was missing before, every single issue we had complaints about before, he's negated those. And so I really urge you, I understand why people weren't enthusiastic, but I have to tell you, he was put through the steps. I mean, he had five rigorous interviews with me before he even got before this council. Um, the work we do, that all of us do, isn't just in this room. We all spend, in most, you know, this is a part-time job. Most of us don't have the luxury of, of having a pension or anything else. Just a job top of our other professions, you know, to, to pay our mortgages. Um, every single member of this council works so hard and is so diligent in conducting so many interviews in so much deep research. I mean, these councils, you know, newer than me, spend a tremendous amount of time, not just in their districts, but meeting with activists and meeting with people so we can become experts on this idea um, of parole and all these other criminal justice reform issues. I mean, frankly, I'm, I'm still in touch with people who appeared before this council, you know, back in the, uh, Patrick administration. Well, you know, the very first commutation that happened in the Patrick administration, not everyone in this room voted for that commutation. And that wasn't a murder. That was a drug charge. Right? So the 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 record you hear from my fellow counselors, it's a real different world right now than it was seven or eight years ago. People are being much more compassionate. And we've all, each one of us has become more educated about criminal justice reform and what they can do. I mean, I'm thrilled to hear Council Devaney say that, you know, she thinks there should be someone who may have been incarcerated be on parole. I think it's a great idea. She hasn't voted that way all the time. So it's nice to know that she's come about to believe that. I'm thrilled to hear it. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Before I hear from the next witness, Jean Trinstein wants to address no, hold on one second. Dean Trinstein wants to address what uh, Councillor Kennedy and Councillor uh, Duff brought up. If you want to say very briefly, if you just stand up and just. Um, in order to know the votes of somebody on the parole board, you have to do a public records request. Therefore, but I'm saying that that is a complicated, the public records request are not coming back quickly right now because the board is strapped. It, it's taking much longer than 10 days. So it doesn't surprise me that Parole Watch would not know the voting records of someone. And I think that when you when you mentioned that, in order to get the votes, um, it, it's a pop, it's, it's pretty it is. interesting process. It is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that clarification. You know the facts. So, so. That's why my point is don't criticize until you actually know the facts. I, I will just say, I'm not criticizing, and I'm glad to hear his, and I, I am aware of that, but all I was responding to was my lived experience of sitting through hearings. That's all. Thank you very much for your uh, insight. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from attorney Lisa Newman Polk. Hey, good morning. Um, almost afternoon. I'm Lisa Newman Polk. I'm a, an attorney. I'm a licensed certified social worker. I met Sarah Coughlin nine years ago through our social work connection. Um, as a brief background to why I think my experience, both knowing Sarah and um, 
just in my work is relevant. I was a public defender in the trial world for a while, and then I detoured into social work, doing outpatient work with people on parole and probation, but specifically around trauma and addiction. And then I worked at Susan Baranowski as a um, clinician. And it was after I got out of working at Susan and decided to go back to law and was working in the drug courts and specializing around uh, addiction and the law that Sarah and I came together. And it was um, just a remarkable person to find come into my life because uh, even social workers and attorneys have secondary trauma to the work that we do. And Sarah and I have actually collaborated for many years on presentations around addiction in the law. We probably get eight or nine PowerPoint presentations in various venues. I want to emphasize how much she is an absolute expert in addiction and not just in a book kind of way, but in a on the ground working with people providing therapy, getting people into the treatment that they need. She understands this in a way that the parole board really needs. Um, more recently, my parole, uh, my practice as an attorney has been doing life or parole work. So I've been doing that for the last six years. So I've been appearing before the board for that time. And I'm acutely aware of how much we need not just one social worker on the board. We really need more than that. And I completely agree that we need social workers who have experience around the criminal legal system. Um, even though Sarah hasn't worked inside, it's as if she has, because she relates to all of the issues that I've talked about from working inside. I do want to really commend Maura Healy's administration, her staff. I mean, truly the fact that Sarah was recruited tells me so much about the administration and has made me really excited. And while as somebody appearing before the board with many clients, um, I am definitely concerned about the fact that we have parole board members who are overworked. I also really appreciate the administration trying to get more Sarah Coughlin's because that really is what we need. We don't want to just be filling these slots. She is a phenomenal person. <laughs> workhorse and she's just going to do tremendous things to the board. So I just wanted to say that in support. Thank you. Any questions, uh, Councilor DePaulo? Thank you, Councilor. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, when you talk about uh, the value that a social worker has to the parole board, is part of that being connected to the resources and the programming in the community where folks are being released where, where the re-entry is actually happening in the communities? I think for sure that, but I'll say from my perspective as a social worker, I'm more, I've been more on the clinical side. And I think that part is also really invaluable because the reason I like doing parole work is because it's a merging of law and social work. It's trying to understand a person's story. Mr. Coleman already spoke about the trauma of childhood and social work is premised on the idea of person in environment. And that's what we're really dealing with where, you know, Sarah and I will always tell you there is a formula for going to prison, especially in a life sentence as a child. I mean, the level of trauma and victimization that people who are incarcerated are experiencing when they are young is unfathomable to the public outside who doesn't know that. And then people are treated as if they are just the predators, they are just the problems. And there's not enough of appreciation for the fact that there's so much healing that needs to go on that was talked about earlier. And I think social workers who are in this field of social work understand that profoundly and that helps with i should say judging you know whether a person is suitable and what their life story is and helping to draw that story out because that's so much of what i'm doing i'm trying to help somebody draw their story out which is what sarah has been able to do and i hope from a board perspective we'll be able to do because it's not easy for people to just open up about being abused neglected etc Thank you. I agree with that. And, and I would add, I think that besides the clinical piece that you speak to, which is the critical foundation, I do think there's a need to have uh, a knowledge of the communities where folks are re-entering. Absolutely. And so, you know, representing District 7, which includes the second largest city in New England, and we haven't had anyone on the parole board west of 495 for as long as I can count backwards. Um, to me, that's also a concern. So I know that um, when we look at future openings on the parole board, there's, I hope that we find Sarah Coughlin, Central Mass and Western Mass version, which would be fantastic. I am speaking to that point, because I think that it is critical that we understand what's happening in the actual communities. Mr. Fitchburg, Lemonster, Southbridge, Holyoke, <laughs> Springfield, and so forth. I agree. So just to merge the two thoughts, it's the idea of 
when so, when a professional is able to really understand the person, then they understand what resources they need and that matching and understanding what revocations are really worth being revoked for versus are worth needing to be treated, which is something I know that Sarah really has a profound vision about. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing this this morning. Thanks, Councilor Rod Devaney. Um, can you tell me what is the majority of the type of cases that you've interacted with the nominee? Um, so, in terms of cases, what we have mostly worked on is policy level work and training people on addiction and the law. So, we've worked on policy issues around not incarcerating people for relapse. Um, we've been very active together in NESW um, when she was president of that organization. And then other than that, um, there's been a lot of just sharing back and forth of the shared struggle for doing the work. Well, as a witness, I'm asking, we're supposed to ask you what you know about the nominee, but I, I am concerned about the prisons. And when I've gone out to visit, they're different. And there's not one size that fits all. And I'm concerned about that. So I want to talk to you. I want to find out who I can talk to, who is head of all of this. Because I go to Norfolk, and it's like a community prison. And um, when you meet with someone like that, they come out with a nice sweater and pants and shirt and shoes and it, it, it's a nice when i went to bridgewater you meet with someone they come in an orange suit they almost fist me i have to be so many feet away i i was concerned about that and i'm concerned they're not getting the health benefits there's people dying inmates are dying at bridgewater so i just wanted to know i'll talk to you later because i have to know who to talk to who's head of all of this because it's not uniform one prison is different than the other. Do you see that? I do see that. Part of that is because you're talking about classification levels. So you're talking maximum security, medium security, and uh, lower security, and then a mental health, well, prison, I should say, is the hospital. Um, and, and so within each prison, people are also in different structures. So they could be in the solitary confinement unit, which Sorry, we still basically have solitary confinement, even though it's under a different name. Um, I don't want to blow everyone's mind up, but the fact is that I just talked to a client yesterday who's in the unit, the BAU, Behavioral Adjustment Unit, and table time is sitting shackled to a table, and otherwise it's walking around in a cage for an hour and a half, so for three hours out of cell. So well, it depends on where you are. Well, in meaning, choosing two, let's just say two of them that I met in those two prisons, um, they, they had the same sentence life without parole so if they weren't treated any differently in the prison it was the whole prison policy that i saw and i i was shocked i was shocked because i thought you know if if you can let an inmate wear a sweater and pants and casual shoes i guess a little respect to the person no matter what the case is but i'm just saying that um I, I want to look into it. I want to look into Bridgewater because they're not getting the health benefits, and I'm really concerned about it. I just was wondering if you've gone to these prisons, you see the difference. I've been in every one of the prisons across the state except for except for Bridgewater. But you know, it's not my position to ask you. She's the nominee, but thank you for allowing me to ask that. Yeah. The commissioner of the prisons is the one to talk thank to. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Of uh, thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Jack Kelly. Morning, sir. Okay. Thank you, for everyone, for the board. Um, I had to fight to testify to come here, as I see, and Sarah is worth it. So uh, that's why I did. Uh, I've known Sarah for a very long time. I have had the pleasure of knowing her on a friendly basis, but also working with her as a community board member on the Charlestown Turnaround, which is part of uh, the Brigham and Women's um, operation. So I've seen her work up front. But I've also seen the integrity that she brings. In addition, and this is something that I didn't plan on talking about, a lot of talk about prisons and the DOC. I had a brief stint as the executive, executive director of treatment and classification. Do I have that right? Yes, and that's right before the parole vote. So um, I didn't last that long because my perspective of what I was going there to do was much more treatment oriented. I would actually talk to Sarah about my brief tenure while she was there. and. We shared a lot of similar problems that we had with the DOC, so I don't want to get too much into that, but it was something that was striking as I was sitting there listening to it. I could 
we don't have enough time to answer some of the questions about the DOC and my issues with them and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm here to enthusiastically support Tara Coughlin and, and it is necessary, not as a, just what I've seen in the field to be, have someone of her caliber, her insight, not just from a technical perspective, like her resume, like we've talked about, but also to see it on the ground. This isn't just something that I've witnessed in a two year to two, three year period. I've seen the transition of how society happened when we had the opiate epidemic, she took the lead and was effective. And then when racism happened after the George Floyd incident, she took the lead in Charleston and it was effective. I don't know, else, I don't know what else to say. I mean, the, the record speaks for itself. And I'm here to answer any other questions. Just keep it simple. So. Thank you. Uh, any uh, questions of Mr. Kelly, Counselor? Take the time to come. So, um, if you could give one adjective, what do you think that this nominee brings to the parole board? What quality? Integrity. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other part? Counselor uh, Jacobs. I didn't catch what organization you were with. I'm sorry. Sweet. I'm with a lot of different organizations. <laughs> yeah, I am the uh, right now. You were on the board of something, and I didn't catch. So I served on the community board of the Turn It Around Coalition, but Turn it the reason as you, I was sort of starting over my words is that I've served on it so long, it's, it's had so many different iterations and et cetera, et cetera. And I've been with her every step of the way. I also worked for uh, Mass General Hospital when it was Mass General Hospital in a community grant as a community liaison. And we worked together and I was, I came from City Hall as the neighborhood liaison for Charleston and then came into the healthcare field, which was very hard for me. There were a lot of restraints and Sarah uh, was able to help direct me to uh, be successful in that. So I, I also think that that emphasis is important because she could be a leader and a manager and it's kind of important for someone like me and she was able to do it. Well, thank you very much. I, thank you very much. Any other questions of uh, Mr. Kelly? Thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak uh, in support of the nomination of Sarah Beth Coughlin? There, no, uh, there being no one uh, else who wants to speak in, uh, in, in, uh, in support, that will close that portion of the hearing. Is there anyone here who would like to speak in opposition? No one in uh, opposition, that will close that portion of the hearing. Now, I'm gonna let you decide on this one. <laughs> Five minutes or six minutes, the lieutenant governor is going to come in. If and you have, you can take as much time as you want. If you think you're going to take longer than six minutes, I would suggest we wait until after. What What would you like to do? It's about six. Excuse me. I, I'm sorry. It's about six minutes, so it's it's whatever is most. I'm important. sorry. I, I got a cold. It's about, my it's about six minutes, so whatever is most convenient for you. Watch the clock fast and do it now, please. <laughs> Wants to do it now, Chris. Uh, we'll do it now. Right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank Governor Healy, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, and the nominating committee for recommending me to the Massachusetts Parole Board. Seeing Governor Healy pardon 11 people in her first year speaks volumes about her leadership, and I'm honored and excited to, for the potential to work for her administration. I was thrilled to hear that the council members have been advocating for and seeking out a social worker to sit on this board. Social work is not just what I do, it's part of who I am. For as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated by why humans do the things that we do. When I was heading to college, I couldn't decide whether I wanted to study psychology or social work. I was intrigued by the idea of psychology to better understand human behaviors through psychological testing and diagnostic criteria. But what ultimately led me to pursue the degree in social work is the fundamental guiding principle of the in-person in person and environment perspective, which seeks to understand an individual's behavior in light of the environment in which that person lives. This approach to human behavior aligned more with my core belief system. I earned a bachelor's in social work from Providence College and a master's in social work from Boston College. I started my postgraduate career in a residential program for adolescent girls working primarily with survivors of sexual trauma and sexual exploitation. I then transitioned to a position in the Boston Police Department, it was YSPN at the time, it's now called Youth Connect, where I was responsible for treating young people and their families who became involved in the criminal legal system. There is no more profound wake-up call of the racial injustice of our society than working within the criminal legal system. As I got to know each child and family sitting in their homes, witnessing the egregious disparities in which they lived, common themes arose. Racism, 
trauma, structural oppression, lack of economic mobility, lack of stable housing, limited access to healthy foods, poor mental health and addiction treatment. These are some of the root causes of entry into the carceral system, and they are too often inaccurately pathologized as characterological disorders. After these early professional experiences, I wanted to move more upstream in the healthcare system. I was fortunate enough to receive a job at Mass General Hospital's Center for Community Health Improvement, a program that recognizes environmental conditions have a greater impact on health than medical treatment and genetics combined. As the director of the Charlestown Coalition, I worked in partnership with community to define and address health concerns and develop systems for structural changes. I created a youth diversion program to provide opportunity for youth to be supported after teenage mistakes without a criminal arraignment. I assisted with the development of the Charlestown Drug Court, where I helped coordinate clinical care for participants. I created a program at Charlestown High School to address chronic marijuana use with treatment rather than furthering the school to prison pipeline with suspensions. I have provided treatment to thousands of people with severe substance use disorder and provided clinical supervision to recovery coaches on the ground. I'm a huge advocate for individualized care and science based approaches to addiction and drug use. I understand the connection between violence between behind the wall and violence in the community. I have firsthand experience dealing with the consequences of what crime, violence, and drugs do to community. I have sat with mothers who have lost their children to violence, overdose, and natural life sentences. I have held these mothers as they have let out primal screams in the face of the most agonizing moments of their life. I have personally lost many clients and continue to go through my own process to make sense of their lives being cut short. I currently convene a Healthy Alternatives to Violence Network Breakfast that brings together violence prevention providers across the city, creating new ways of connecting and collaborating. I also work in partnership with the Louis D. Baum Peace Institute to bring alternative healing modalities to survivors of trauma and violence, specifically mothers that have lost their children. When I started this work, children were considered adults at age 17. I have had many traumatized children pushed through the adult system and have seen how the carceral system inflicts further harm and exacerbates master mental health systems. I've been a longtime advocate for policies that take into consideration the science of an emerging adult brain development and treating children who do offend in developmentally appropriate ways. I have presented on this topic to schools of social work, public school systems, and lawyers. I have also seen the consequences of long-term incarceration and have worked with many people serving life sentences who are now on parole in the community. More recently, I've provided clinical and reentry services for the Transformational Prison Project, where I was trained extensively in restorative practices. I am well-versed on the physiological, emotional, relational, and physical challenges of reintegration. Through various jobs over the years, including a long-time private therapy practice, I have worked with people incarcerated in almost every house of correction and every state prison in the Commonwealth. I've been qualified in many courts across the state as an expert in addiction, trauma, and other mental health conditions. I've evaluated people, coordinated reentry plans, and implemented those reentry plans in community. I have a solid understanding of the programs that work for specific needs. We know that most people incarcerated long term have been impacted by severe racial sentencing disparities. More cases for clemency, commutations, and pardons need to be brought forward. I believe that we all deserve to live in a safe and thriving communities. And I know that there are some people that, if released today, would commit further harm to communities. As a parole board member, I would commit to fully understanding each individual before me to the best of my ability. I would commit to ensuring that release plans are both appropriate and possible. As a social worker on the board, I would use my in-person environment perspectives to understand crime, institutional histories, and disciplinary reports. I would work to ensure that survivor family members are informed of release plans appropriately, compassionately, and understanding that grief is never a linear process. A range of emotions emerge for survivors of crime when the responsible party returns to the community. Having experienced firsthand the power of restorative justice, I would also advocate to make this healing practice accessible to interested survivors. The work of the parole board members is not easy. If appointed, I commit to continuing to care for myself, 
so that I'm able to maintain compassion and judgment in this job for the long haul. I'm a hard worker, I'm a team player, and I look forward to giving this opportunity everything I have. I am happy to share more about my experiences and expertise and welcome your questions. Do you have any one uh, family members or friends that you'd like to introduce that are here? Oh, right. <laughs> we always give that option. That's why I wanted. <laughs> Thank you. At this point, the Lieutenant Governor will be coming in momentarily. So we're going to suspend the hearing. Okay. Excuse me. We're going to suspend the hearing and then we're going to take a break. I'd say 35 minutes after the assembly and then when we can resume. Thank you.
Ready to get started? I will kick us off. It's uh, 12.07 p.m. And I'd like to recognize Councillor Ferreira for a prayer and for leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just would like uh, a, a moment to uh, reflect on the uh, problem with uh, immigration in our state and in our country. And uh, hopeful that we can find a solution that meets everyone's needs. Right. I'd like to recognize Councillor Kennedy for a motion to record advice and consent for the financial warrant. So moved, Governor. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor DiPaolo. All those in favor? All those opposed? The ayes have it. I could recognize Councillor Duff for a motion to record advice and consent for the pending list of notaries public and justices of the peace. So moved, Governor. Thank you. Council, uh, sports. <laughs> motion made by Councillor Duff, seconded by Councillor Devaney. All those in favor? All those opposed? The ayes have it. Um, I'd like to recognize Councillor Devaney for a motion to record advice and consent to pardon Joanne Booth. So moved. Motion made and seconded by Councillor Jacobs. Any further discussions? Can I speak now? This nominee? Yes, you may. Um, Lieutenant Governor, this is the first time in my 24 years that I have ever seen someone for pardon that had such a tragic life. And if it wasn't for two people, Trini and um, Penny Dowling and Jody for more than words, we wouldn't be voting on this patent today. This man. Council, we're doing Joanne Booth. Joanne Booth. I'm sorry, what? This we're doing Joanne Booth right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, it's been a very tough week for me. I'm sorry. Um, first of all, she has gone through an awful lot. But you know what? We believe in second chances. And she has been productive in her life. She's gone on with her life. And I think it's time, more than time, that we pardon her. And, and that's it. And the one thing that we don't want to do we don't want to exploit these people. And that's the thing that I think we all feel. We don't want that out in public. They want to live their lives. They don't want their name out there that, that for what they did. We want to show how they've come after that because we know in their lives it's affected what criminal acts that they had done. So I am very pleased to make that motion and I hope that the vote will be unanimous. Thank you. I'm sorry. Any other comments or questions? Councilor Jacobs. Just to, I, I'd love to take this opportunity to comment. Um, I'm, I'm so happy to see the pardons coming through from this administration, the courage to bring them immediately out of the gate and the nature of the cases that are coming before us um, are so worthy of, of the pardons that I, I am excited to be a part of voting on today. I did just want to comment across the last packet of pardons and this packet of pardons, the almost exclusively 100%, oh, there might have been an exception here or there, but these are originating criminal offenses occurring during teenage years, during emerging adult years. This particular pardon is a, a dangerous weapon was used of flinging a sneaker as an 18 year old. The, the nature of the crimes themselves, but the age at which they happened. I think it's so important just to highlight and reflect on the injustices that have been carried out in the distant decades past when emerging adulthood wasn't as well understood as it is today with the cognitive development and the impact of teen impulse control issues, not understanding consequences occurring and then, and then having an impact that has had a lifelong uh, limitation on a full life lived. It's just, it's to me, a, um, a travesty of justice that I'm happy to see us correcting. And I hope that we'll be doing more of that going forward. 
So I appreciate you all giving me the moment just to address it because it's something that's really been of concern for me. Thank you, Councilor. Any other uh, comments or questions regarding the motion to uh, pardon Joanne Booth? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Next item, uh, I would like to recognize Councilor Devaney for a motion to record advice and consent to pardon Kenny Jean. Is that your motion, Councilor? Jean, yeah, but, but Kenny, Kenny Jean. Jean. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by uh, Councilor Jacobs. I don't just to say, Manning, the governor, in my 24 years, I never saw such a tragic story come before me about the life of this uh, petitioner. Um, this young man came from Haiti, and uh, mother and father had given him up in Haiti to a grandmother, and um, they were physically abusive, and he came to this country really uh, abandoned, became homeless. He was alone. And um, he, um, he ended up homeless, as I said. And I'm going to speak for myself, not for the other counselors. But we have government agencies that are supposed to reach out to people, especially when they're going for a patent to help them. Well, the children and family service did not provide, did not lend the helping hand that he needed. They even were going to get him citizenship. He lived in fear every day that he was going to be deported. Here's a young man that came when he was six years old. He doesn't know the language in Haiti. He doesn't have a relative there. So imagine that. And so he depended on that agency to get him citizenship. So a lot of this this pardon is so important. So I did something that never was done before, first time. I sent to all the counselors the parole board hearing of this petitioner because they say a picture's worth a thousand words and I believed it. And I don't want to exploit him in, in any way. He has different um, limitations that I will not get into. So he's gone on with his life. But I have to tell you, I'm concerned how many people out there that don't have someone like Patty, who was his attorney, and Jody, more than words, if they hadn't come into his life and advocated for him, we wouldn't be here today. And you know, Lieutenant Governor, there probably was 42 people at his parole board hearing. He is so deserving. He is so in need, and as I said, the agency let him down, and I hope it'll be unanimous, let him continue in his productive life, and um, I, I, it's, it's very emotional, so I, I can't find any more words to say, so thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions per pertaining to this motion? So we have a motion on the floor to uh, advise and consent a pardon to Kenny Jean. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, next up, I'd like to recognize Councillor Jacobs for a motion to record advice and consent to pardon Murphy Smith. So moved. Is there a second? Okay. Seconded by Councillor Fer Ferreira. Any uh, comments or questions regarding this? Any discussion? Seeing none. I'm sorry, was I supposed to be doing this as a roll call? Or a change? It's unanimous, so I don't think it matters. Okay, well, let's start doing it the right way on this one. I apologize. It's right on the agenda. So thank you for letting me know and not calling me out, but let's do it the right way. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, if you could please call the roll. Councilman Kennedy? Aye. Councilman DePaulo? Yes. Yes. Jacobs? Yes. Defer? Yes. Councilman Tagini? Yes. Councilman Yes. yes. Councilman Dunn? Yes. Seven members voting, seven in the affirmative. The matter carries. Uh, next up, I'd like to recognize Councillor Ferreira for a motion to record advice and consent to pardon Evan Willey. So moved. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor DePola. DePaula. Any 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 uh, additional discussion? Seeing none, if I could ask uh, the Secretary to please call the roll. Councillor DePaula. Yes. Councillor Jacobs. Yes. Councillor Ferreira. Yes. Councillor Tadini. Yes. Councillor Ayala. Yes. Councillor Duff. Yes. Councillor Kennedy. Yes. Seven members voting, seven in the affirmative. The matter carries. Thank you. Sorry for missing the roll calls earlier. Councilor Vanny, is there a motion that you have? Please, with you. We, we have a few other items, but um, I guess I would just like to really 
commend the members of the governor's council for both the professionalism and the due diligence that you put into this process as a new administration working through this, this pardon process and thank our legal counsel who spearheaded the effort. Um, really appreciate uh, both uh, your collaboration, uh, the professionalism, and the ability to move through things like this in a in a really professional manner. So thank you. It's appreciated. And okay, Councillor Devaney. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I want to thank you and the governor for sending these up because um, we, for the parole board, we really are desperate. But I, I did want to to place the statement on the record here today, I'm going to be putting it in the, the governor's uh, council office. Um, I, I know joy in, in doing it, but I, I do want to uh, put it in the record. Um, last week, I presided over a hearing and for Kenny Jane, and it was very hot rendering to me. And as I said, I, I sent out his um, uh, the, the hearing that he had. So, um, Councilor Ferrara gave notice that he had a court commitment and was unable to attend the hearing. So, all councilors immediately went to the public assembly after the hearing. But only one councilor attended the hearing. Uh, when Councilor Ionella held two pardon hearings back in July, Every counselor attended. After the hearing, I asked one of the counselors who did not attend if this was, if he was part of a boycott. And he said, yeah, that's what you could call it. The main responsibility of counselors is to attend hearings to prepare for the vote of that person, that nominee at the public assembly. And the boycott did not disrespect me. It disrespected the office of the governor's council, the petitioner, the witnesses, and the people that attended. I have learned, Lieutenant Governor, it's not always popular to do the right thing. When the councilors voted on the phone to stop the streaming of our hearings to the public, I fought. I got it back, not alone, for two months. I got support of the ACLU, Mass Perg, Disability Centers, League of Women Voters, and more. A counselor I served with for some time was interviewed and asked what she thought of Councilor DeVianney restoring the hearings to the public. She replied, and this went in print in the newspapers, Councilor DeVianney has mental disorders. That was in public print. And in the Globe, it was said that I don't go along, get along with the council. Well, I will not vote for a sitting councilor, for clerk magistrate. When I am charged to vote for clerk magistrates from the people in the public who applied, that's not getting along, not getting along, it's not going along. I find no joy placing this statement on the record but it has to be said, I'm not perfect. I don't always say the perfect thing, but I'm committed to represent the public. And I respect my colleagues. And I have even put it into a prayer at a public assembly asking for respect. So this statement will be in the office and it hurts to say it, but it just can't continue. It, it just can't continue. I'm, I'm trying my best. I'm full time. I, I just met with this nominee. She probably was a thousand and one that I have met. And I know everyone here cares. And I know they are doing their best. And I don't want smirking, please. But I'm just saying, Thank I'm you. going to be putting this statement Thank you. In, in the office. And, and it's kind of like, type, I have to typo, so I'll type it over for you. Um, I buy no, but this is not kindergarten stuff. We are. Councilor Devaney. Please make sure you direct your comments through the chair. I don't, want, I, I, I don't want to debate over this. I've just said. Devaney, you, you. you have uh, had. Uh, time to offer a comment with regard to uh, yes, Councillor Kennedy. I don't know where a boycott come, came from. I think that's completely nonsensical. Um, it's the first I've heard of that. 
I wasn't here because I was on trial down at the Boston Municipal Court because counsel, for two reasons, Council Devaney and like the rule that she's always trying to enforce on a two week date on hearings, did it in five days. That's number one. Number two, I don't believe in doing hearings on these pardons because of that device there. It defeats the purpose of the pardon, uh, which is designed to let people move on with their lives. The pardon doesn't mean anything when they can just Google it and look at the hearing, okay? So I don't believe in doing pardons on these, except in a very unusual circumstance. We had one of those in the fall. I wasn't thrilled about that hearing going on either, but um, ge as a general rule, I don't think we should be doing them. So I certainly wasn't in a rush to get up here, but I don't know anything about a boycott. I think that's nonsensical. I was on trial. That's why I wasn't here for the hearing. Thank you, Councilor Kennedy. Councilor Devine, I have a lot to have a back and forth. I said I do want to debate, but let me just finish. Sure, I never heard from any councils. I sent them a letter. I sent, them the, I sent them the video. Councilor Devaney. They call me and say, I can't come. I got noticed by Councilor, Councilor Devaney that he wasn't coming. Councilor Devaney. All I'm saying is that Councilor Devaney. Open. They got the letter. I told them about the hearing. I did everything that I could. Thank you, Councilor Devaney. Thank you. That we're trying to avoid a back and forth. And frankly, I just reiterated what I thought was a very professional process for these particular uh, pardons to come before this board. Whatever the hearings were, it did give people an opportunity uh, to offer additional information if necessary. And we just voted on four, I think, incredible individuals that are going to be having a second chance based on for opportunities that they are very worthy of based on, as Councillor Jacobs pointed out, things that happened early on in their lives. I think that's a really proud moment for uh, this governor's council. It recertifies why this is an important part of the process. And I'd hate for that to be harmed by uh, you know this sort of the last piece in this meeting. So let's keep in mind like what we just did today in a meaningful way. Thank you all for your participation in it and, and how this approach was handled, I think, with due diligence and in really good form. Uh, Councilor DiPaolo. May I an unrelated son? Yes. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, in the interest of uh, how this council functions and good governance and in eliminating ambiguity in how we function, um, I rise to make a motion uh, and I present to the council uh, a motion that we establish an ad hoc committee charged with drafting a set of council rules and reviewing the council questionnaire that is sent to pending nominees. This subcommittee would be comprised of myself and Councillor Jacobs, and it will solicit input from all councillors and submit our work to the council for discussion and consideration at the first council assembly in November 2023. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councillor Ionella. No, I have a motion. Oh, get a second first. Well, Seconded by Councillor Duff. Under discussion, Councillor Ionella. Two things. First of all, I think anyone who wants to be on the committee should be on the committee. Uh, I think that's important. I try to politely tell my good colleagues, we have rules. I, excuse me. We have 29 rules. I, I will submit them, I will forward them to you, and I would be surprised if you don't adopt 98 percent of them. We have rules, as I indicated to you at the hearing today, very briefly, it's the governor office, it's the governor's office who sets the date, time, place of the hearing. That's a rule. It's the council from the district who sets the date and the time for any hearings. That's a rule. It's the executive secretary who keeps a record. That's a rule. We have 29 rules. They're in writing. They're not my rules. They're the council rules. And I will send you all a copy of the council rules. Councilor Duff? I'm sorry, Councilor Ayanella, whenever you're done. No, I'm finished. Yes. Okay. No, I will like to say, Councilor Duff, Councilor Duff, Councilor Duff, twice we've had this discussion. Uh, under Governor Patrick and under Governor Baker. And this is literally the first time you've ever spoken and said we have rules. So I'm delighted to see them because we've submitted drafts before and we are, I, I believe we're required to have rules. So if there was a set that well, we can work off of, that would be terrific. So it sounds like we have to today. Thank you. These so are all rules. Could you have a motion on to create this subcommittee and under, the, under discussion with Councilor Kennedy? There was a number of years ago we adopted a written set of rules that I think have been carried over year to year, but we've never formally done that. So I think it would make sense to review them, update them, and formally adopt them again. Councilor Devaney? Um, 
We, we did, I, I helped to have a meeting here and it was just the council, no press, no one else was this allowed to talk about. about rules and that, and, and we do have them and I have them in my drawer, one of the rules, but they voted no. So that's how it's been through the years, but there was in the seventies and there was in the nineties. I'm not going to bring up all the history. <laughs> we have a motion that's been made by Councilor DiPaolo and it's been seconded by Councilor Duff to form this subcommittee and it sounds like there's a good basis of work to work on. Are there, is there any further discussion on this? Otherwise, I'll just have the motion to allow this to proceed. Councilor Ionella, did you have a oh, OK. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. OK, I think I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Made by Councilor Jacobs, seconded by Councilor DiPaolo. All those in favor? Any, okay. any opposed? The ayes have it. Stand adjourned.
to Councillor Duff. Hi. Um, I don't have a lot of questions for you, uh, some comments, uh, since we spent probably a good hour and a half together with Councillor Jacobs a uh, week ago Monday and had a pretty in-depth, serious discussion about your uh, view of parole and, and your background. Uh, your resume is incredibly impressive. Uh, somebody commented how long it was. I think I made the comment that War and Peace was faster than that um, when they saw you. Um, just just a couple of things. You're going to be going into a situation where um, the workload is going to be really, really heavy because of the how short-handed they are and uh, and have been. So there's a backlog of work to do. Uh, you're ready to hit the ground running? I mean, it's going to be a lot of work for a while. And it doesn't sound like you're going to get immediate help. Right. Yes, for sure. I'm, um, you know, I, I currently oversee multiple programs at Mass General and I have client cases that I'm going to need to terminate. So it'll take a little bit of time before I can really get started. But once I hit the ground, I am ready to ready to move. I'm a workhorse and um, as a social worker, I've always had multiple jobs. Um, so I'm very used to high workload. I'm really used to long lengthy files. I read every page of um, work before clients present me with cases um, and really do my due diligence of ensuring that I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, the, the workload is, is not one of my concerns. Um, do you think that too many people are incarcerated right now? I do. And um, tell me about your, how you feel about mandatory minimum sentences. Um, I actually have a real challenge with mandatory minimum sentences. I think it ties hands um, judges and it doesn't really able, we're not really able to make decisions that's best for the individual in cases when judges hands are tied. There's so many times I've gone in front of judges where they've wanted to offer a different sentence and they just can't. You know, what I'm finding is there are a lot of prosecutors in Massachusetts and I do defend for get along with every DA in the state, but um, they're out there campaigning and talking about, you know, uh, criminal justice reform, and they're talking, and someone might even talking about how they don't support mandatory minimum sentences. And then when folks like me go in there and say, hey, give this guy a break, don't, uh, don't give him the mandatory minimum, they're not breaking anything down. They're not using prosecutorial discretion. You've been involved in the courts. Have you been seeing that? I have seen that um, quite a bit, actually. Yeah. Yes. It's, um, it's kind of crazy. Anyway, I don't have, as we spent a lot of time together last week. I enjoyed it very much and I appreciate you coming over to talk to us. Uh, I don't have any additional questions for you. Um, you you're certainly in the top two candidates I've ever seen in the time. I've been 14 years almost I've been on here uh, in terms of the parole board, and I'm going to be delighted to vote for the next one. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say something out, one more thing. Uh, two things. Okay, one is I am going to have to leave shortly because I have a court issue to deal with. Um, I'll watch the rest of the um, interview on YouTube later on, and I, you know, I commented on your resume. Uh, but when you first got nominated, somebody who's been screaming and yelling for social workers and non-prosecutors since I've been on here called me up and said, "Wow, we got somebody really, really outstanding, a big support." Thank you, Councillor Eileen Duff. Thank you. Um, welcome. And um, I'm actually glad you got to talk to Council Kennedy first. Uh, yeah, you, you know, it's clear that we're very excited to see you. You've got a great group of supporters. Um, you know, I don't always agree with all of them, but I respect all of them. Um, but that's what makes the world go around. Right? So thanks for applying. I'm going to ask you a couple of the questions that we already spoke about. Why do you want to make a vote? Um, to be honest, the parole board really wasn't on my radar until about a month ago. I really love my work that I do currently. I um, manage a lot um, at the hospital doing community um, benefits and social determinants of health work. I have five active cases that are going to be up in front of the parole board right now that I was really committed through. I really love the individual work that I do. I got a call. Um, from a colleague and, and multiple people that um, within the governor's office asking if I would throw my my hat in the ring. It's just there's a meeting going on in the, the other office. 
I'm sorry, carry on. Yes, so um, I received a call asking if, if I would be if it would be something that I would be interested in and um, really looking into where this administration is and the direction that it's heading. I've also heard spoke with some current um, board members. I talked with Dr. Bonner and Chair Hurley, um, and it sounds like there's really progress. It seems like in the right direction. It seems like there's a lot more morale and that folks are working together really well. And um, and it seems like a really opportune time to make some really big changes for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Yeah. Well, you know, we're <laughs> those of us who might be considered uh, more progressive or left or whatever, we're, we're thrilled with, with the things that are happening with the administration. And uh, albeit if some things may not happen as quickly as we like, we would rather have the right thing than just anything. So um, I think that's clear. I, I'm curious because in the past, you have been really directly involved with a lot of organizations who have been highly critical of the parole board. Um, in fact, you're going to be working with some of these very people that they've really been very critical of. Mm -hmm. um, and some of these criticisms have had a really serious adverse effect on them and on their morale, because there was a plethora of other reasons, which I'm sure you know, that really broke the soul in the spirit of this board um, in the last eight years. Um, what's, what's changed and how do you think you're going to deal with it? You know, because you're going to be working with people that basically, you know, they're going to be thrilled to have you and they have only had good conversations with people there, excited about having you on. But you've also aligned yourself with people who've really ripped them. Have you thought about that? Yes, I actually, um, I'm not new to, to controversy or trying to get folks who see the world from different lenses on the same page. I've done a lot of coalition work, which is really bringing in key stakeholders um, to deal with um, generalized health issues, the health of community, where the ultimate goal is the same, but the direction of heading there might be people have different perspectives on. And so I have a, a, a lot of experience in sort of listening to people, understanding perspectives, and not taking things personally. These are systemic issues that we're all reeling with and trying to understand. And so I think it's natural, especially people directly impacted, are going to have strong feelings about things. Um, and I think I'm, I'm able to sort of hear and listen and understand the challenges that, that we're in and, and what it takes to have change. It takes changes in overnight and it's a, it's a long course and it can be really gruesome and tiring at times, but I'm, I'm committed to, to being a part of it. And things aren't always what they appear to be, you know, in, in like, you know, we have, as you know, talked about a, a fellow who sat in that chair before up to be on the pro board, you know, the, when I first saw the name, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. But you know, you go through, you go through a lot to get there, not just to get there, but to get through us and everything too. And the previous interviews that can happen before you even get, I mean, there's so, there's so much work this council does that we don't talk about. And so to hear that because that, that's coalition building is what it's all about. You and I have talked about being a team player, you know, listening, you've got brilliant people on that on that board right now. You know, you've got four four members, three of who are really seasoned, um, who you have a lot, you know, to share with and to work with. And I think it's I, you seem to have the the uh, personality, I hate using that word, but that you as well with others. Um and, and get that. Um and the other thing I want to talk about is you realize how dangerous this job is. And I mean I'm sure you've had James um, support system, and, and if you don't, this isn't a trick question, by the way, because we didn't talk about this. But I do talk about with this this with judges sometimes, and I really mean it with with parole board members because sometimes the the board members and or their families or friends are are threatened, and it's very serious. Uh, they are right now um, feeling group one. I think they should be in group four. I think their jobs are extremely dangerous. Um, and I hope that you have a support system. I hope you have a, a fit, you know, your, your friends and your spiritual, whatever that means to you, support system. Because this is, the work you've done is tremendous and hard work. But this is like a whole different level. And it may not be there right away when you get there. But there will be those moments when you are in and you know the prisoner was a chair or 
up into the table or physically assaults you. It happens to our board members. And, and that's why when I was mentioning, you know, there are times when for better or for worse, uh, member Kelkos has been brought in to meeting because because he was a football player and he's a big guy and it changes the dynamic in the room. Um, have you this and thought about it and considered it with your inner circle of, of people? Absolutely. I think with any um, work in this realm, there's always risks associated. And um, I think I, I, I answer your question in terms of support network. I have a great um, support network. I'm not concerned about that. Um, and um, the the work is so important. I'm willing to to manage the risk. And, and I have a pretty decent ability to build rapport and to read people and will take measures to protect our safety if necessary. You probably, if, with the work you've done, you know, I, you and I talked briefly when I was really, I'm a chaplain, and when I was doing chaplaincy work and was got a fellowship at Mass General, that place is, I'm, I'm, and I was in the psych unit. So, you know, I was working with, I'm in a locked unit, in a locked unit. So I'm working with seriously ment mentally ill people, and serious addicts at the same time. But the thing about Mass General, that it's just an amazing, it's a machine. I mean, people who, ha you have no idea how that place works and stuff. But you were also, it's A players working with people. And that's what we collectively as a council have been looking for. We're looking for the next A player to go play with our A players. And we're really excited about it because I personally have been very vocal that I don't think we've had some A players there. So I'm happy that you've applied. Um, uh, are you taking a pay cut? I will be. Okay. Uh, again, between all of my jobs. I mean, I, I, you know, this is not, I'm not, these aren't gotcha questions, yeah. but I'm trying to. I'm trying to illustrate publicly, since this is a public hearing, that one of the challenges um, our, our chief legal attorney has told us, we don't pay our board members enough. You guys, they're underpaid. I don't know the last time they got a, a pay increase. And so between being in group one and making what I consider well, not just the work they're doing, but their credentials to be severely underpaid. Um, it's it's a concern. So again, I thank you for being willing to to do that because it is a challenge. The public, and I'm not saying oh, yeah, it's super bad on them, but they don't understand. You know, it's very hard to get great people to take pay cuts to take these jobs. We see it in the judiciary all the time. You know, we see, you know, a lot of the really great lawyers, they're making good money right where they are. Why do they want to be a judge? You know, and people are like, oh, the pension, this and that. They don't need that. You know, most of them don't need it. They're, they're all set. So um, thank you for that. I appreciate it. You know, as somebody who is a, a, an independent contractor, I don't, you know, I understand how hard it is to cobble together the different things and, and to take this job on and I appreciate it. I, I think you're going to work well with the group. You seem to have the right, not just demeanor, you're so enthusiastic. Um, but, but the attitude to really, um, as you said, you used a word that I think was spot on, is collaboration. So um, it just understand, and I know you do, and I guess I just repeat it because this is out there for the universe to hear, that um, these folks have worked in really difficult circumstances uh, for the last administration. And they were, they were overmanaged by uh, a group, you know, from EOPS who frankly don't really know anything about parole in, in really how it works in the nitty gritty, you know, how, how the stuff really works. And it's hard, it's hard for them because they're trying to do, they're trying to do the work of public safety in helping people get out and succeed. You and I talked about the step programs and the different programs. And, and then, but then at the same time, we've got victims we've got to think about. And it's a balance. And it's a balance you're not always going to get right. But all we ask is that you are committed and do your very best. So thank you for your application. We appreciate it. And I'm finished, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councilor DePaulo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Um, we had a great conversation. 
Uh, and as I told you, I want to hone in on some of the back the issues that are particularly of concern to me. Um, and that's because in my professional life, I've worked with um, mainly youth um, who are dealing with trauma, <laughs> whether it's abuse, whether it's bouncing around our foster system, uh, lack of continuity in their education, lack of stable adults in their life. Um, and they end up court involved and disproportionately they end up being black and Latino in our Commonwealth. Uh, and it sets the stage for everything that comes after. So I know that, um, I know that, uh, attorney Foley, uh, earlier mentioned Diachenko, which is a case that the Supreme judicial court issued. And there's been follow-up decisions relating to brain science and how brain science should be taken into account. Um, whether it's uh, in what's already happened, um, eliminating life without parole for folks under certain ages. Um, but what I'm curious about is how does brain development, when folks are coming before the parole board, they're in their adulthood. Um, although in many cases in their young adulthood and what some of us would call their emerging adulthood, how does brain development, uh, how is it gonna be a factor in your assessment of individuals um, in making determinations as a parole board member. Absolutely. I appreciate that question. I think it's a very important one. Um, I don't think any of us would want to be judged by our behaviors or thinking under the age of 18. Um, our, the, our brains, like we have the science to really understand it. Our brains are not fully developed. The prefrontal cortex, which is, helps us make through thinking things through their logical ending, linking decisions to consequences that are happening about that part formed yet. And so we're gonna see more impulsivity. We're gonna see more emotional reaction. It's very hard to think long-term thinking when that part of your brain is not developed yet. And so I think we have to keep that in mind when, and, and we know the science that brains evolve over time. There's neuroplasticity. We understand that pathways in the brain change. And so somebody, when we look at somebody and their behavior at 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, it's gonna be different than it is in, in adulthood. And there's a lot of healing that can take place and people are not who they are. And, and what- You define by who they are as a child. And what you're describing is the, uh, for lack of a better term, the typical developmental stages that we've been as humans. And yet those developmental stages can be delayed or exacerbated by experiences that happen along the way. Is that true? It is true. And so what are some of, so, <clears throat> It would seem to me someone who's endured childhood trauma uh, may, in fact, have further delay in the very development that you're describing. And so I would argue that age that we look at where this is a factor should be actually well into the mid-20s. Does that ring true as your understanding of the science? Absolutely. I would agree with that. 84% um, the last numbers I have available, 84% of the women who are incarcerated in Massachusetts have been survivors of sexual or domestic assault. I would argue it's even higher. Very, uh, I, would, I would agree with that. Um, but I can't verify that, unfortunately. Um, is that something that has an impact on brain development? Absolutely. Having that kind of trauma? Absolutely, all of those forms of trauma. Um, and when, it, when a young person finds themselves incarcerated in the conditions that we heard described this morning, um, where they're entering often with unaddressed trauma and they're not able to access um, the mental health services that would help them heal, um, is incarceration itself under those particular conditions, is that a form of trauma that should be considered? Absolutely, absolutely. That's critical stages of formative brain development that take place. And when you're that takes place in a very toxic setting in which you're afraid. So your amygdala, the survival part of your brain is activated throughout that course of time. It absolutely alters how the brain develops over time. And I wonder how that will impact your assessment of folks' um, institutional record when they come before the parole board. Because again, as was mentioned earlier this morning, oftentimes we look to, or oftentimes, uh, an individual's uh, record is looked to in terms of re uh, programming they've taken advantage of, which we've heard is not always available. So it's not necessarily a relevant indicator of someone's uh, preparedness or someone's motivation. Um, and oftentimes uh, the disciplinary record in our institutions is looked at. 
And as someone who's worked with kids, I wonder, or any, anyone who has any knowledge of how humans react to difficult environments, what is the value of assessing, how would you assess someone's institutional disciplinary record? Because, and I, I just wanna preface this, the commutation hearings that this council held um, in the last couple of years for Mr. Kuntz and Mr. Allen and Mr. Shabazz, these gentlemen were exemplary, exemplary individuals in every sense of the word, in my, in my view, the people that they've, they have become. And um, yet even there, we saw blemishes on the institutional record, which my child would probably not even be grounded for, for doing, but maybe that's, maybe that's a critique of my parenting. So, so what, so how are you going to assess, you know, how are you going to assess when you see an institutional disciplinary record? Absolutely. What kind of factors do you take into account? What do you want to know about that record when you see it? Another really great question. I think there are so many factors that need to be addressed when looking at whether or not somebody is safe in community. And I think there's empathy and holding on to the, the childhood trauma, and there's also realities of how that person is functioning. And so I think the tickets need to be looked at not just as a blanket, oh, they've received this many disciplinary infractions. What were they for? What is happening? And having uh, what is the context of that happening? So many times we've heard of just, you know, disciplinary infractions exactly what they're talking about. And as we look at and considered as minor infractions that are not how they function in society or other people, they may have some serious challenges in the ways that their brains have developed that have made them not safe. Um, and so thinking about how can we, what are they need to be able to, to heal those parts of their brains in ways that, that to be able to function responsibly in society. I have students who are adults now who are incarcerated, who may very well come before the board if you should become a member, which I suspect you will. Um, and in their journey through juvenile court to get where they are today, uh, things like running away from a group home end up being held against them when they ran away because their physical safety was at risk, because the Commonwealth was unable to guarantee their safety. And they run away and they're brought to court and that, that self-protection becomes criminalized. It happens way too often. Because our systems that are set up, our structures of society that are set up to protect children often don't. And so thinking about children are trying to become safe in their own ways. And so understanding where, where they're coming from, where they're going towards, and really understanding the whole person that's in front of you. Oftentimes I have a client right now that's continuing to rack up tickets because he's not, he doesn't want to move into a double cell because he had an incident and he's been in a single cell for about 15 years. Um, and so that is going to be held against him in terms of trying to make a proactive decision on not wanting to get into a situation. So I think things need to be looked at with uh, understanding the context of what the prison culture is like and understanding the context of those systems such as foster care or other um, child protective systems that um, have intentions of, of providing safety for children, but oftentimes do not. The fact that I'm about to bring this up and that has been brought up this morning and in prior hearings says to me that I'm one who looks for hope and I think things are moving in the right direction. But we have issues around racial disparities in our criminal justice system in the country. Um, we have one of the, the numbers, I don't have access to numbers I consider current any longer, but the most recent numbers suggest we have the highest Latino incarceration rate and the 14th highest black incarceration rate in the country. The numbers disproportionately show up in juvenile court. Um, we have reports from uh, the legislatures, a special commission on structural racism in the parole process. We have reports on structural racism that exists in our correction system. And um, we know from the Harvard study, again, which is becoming dated, that there's particular charges where if you're black or Latino, you're going to spend almost 180 days longer in our jails than if you're a similarly situated white defendant. How does this play into your vision of being a pro board member? I think it is hugely, we have a lot of work to do as a society. I think when you look back historically at how we got here in the first move and looking at the war on drugs and who was targeted and what the racial disparities were in, in crack and, and powder um, sentencing and any, um, and, and the whole system of um, the the war on drugs was really meant to oppress um, populations of color. And so really understanding the, 
the laws and, and race disparities at that time need to be looked at, especially for people that have done 50, 30, 20 years that were sentenced at times that um, that we really need to look at commutations and over sentencing. I was just going to ask how clemency can be a tool in this area. Absolutely. I think we need to look at those cases for sure and pushed forward and, and re-examined. And we have a lot of writing wrongs to do. And I'm I have one last question for you. It's conditions of conditions of release. And I recently, uh, I've spent a lot of time talking with parole staff, as Councillor Duff alluded to. We've had hearings where I spent dozens of hours on the phone with staff, not board members, staff, although I do talk to board members regularly as well. Uh, sometimes, oftentimes in tears about morale in the department. Things have turned around. Chair, Chairperson Hurley is doing an outstanding job of guiding that turnaround. Um, the phone calls I get now are positive about things moving in the positive direction. Um, I recently rode along with some parole officers in Worcester and visited some of the programming that exists in Worcester. Um, they were talking to me about conditions, and I heard concerns expressed in particular around the routine. It seems to be ubiquitous use of AA as a condition. I wonder if you could speak to your thoughts on that. Absolutely. Um, I think AA is tremendously healing for many people and it is not, it is one pathway to recovery. It is not a, a standard checkbox that somebody um, should have to endure just for having alcohol use involved in their crime. If you think about a 15 year old that may have had a, a drink at the time of their crime and done 40 years, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have an alcohol use disorder. It, so we have to really look at evaluating people individually, yeah. see what do they actually meet the clinical criteria for an, uh, a substance use disorder. We're going to be very busy on the parole board and doing this carefully tailored individualized conditions is going to be complicated work. It sounds like you have the professional uh, expertise to be able to do that on the fly. Absolutely, and it's it's very it's needed because we're setting people up when we're setting conditions that are inappropriate for what they actually need. And, and to me, AA, which I have loved ones in my life who AA has saved them, they Absolutely. would tell me. Absolutely. However, it is it does have a faith-based component, and I do know folks who are uncomfortable with it. Um, and so I'm concerned about it being used habitually. And similar to dealing with issues of the structural and institutional racism that pervade and are insidiously hidden from our view, when you're dealing with uh, your work as a parole board member, I know it's difficult to swim upstream and to run yeah. these things while working collaboratively. So I'm really hopeful, I have confidence based on my conversations with you and with others who've worked with you, that you're gonna be able to do that. But I'm very hopeful that that will be a priority for you. Absolutely. This Thank you for your time, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Councilor Jacobs. Welcome, glad to see you here. Um, we also had a really rich conversation and very much enjoyed sitting down with you and, and discussing the pro board and, and some of the challenges around it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I, I have been, um, I've begun to visit each of the, uh, the prisons and I've, I've only visited a few so far, but um, my goal is to, to visit them all and to sit down and speak with um, incarcerated people at each of these institutions and hear from them about their experiences, both incarcerated, but having many of them having come before the parole board and having a setback and however many years till the next time they get a crack at it. And some have had multiple cracks at it. Um, and so listening to those experiences. Um, and I, I intend to incorporate the, that input into the questions I have for you today. But having said that, we did receive, I received um, from Parole Watch, uh, a document where they've been doing the work of visiting and speaking with incarcerated people and, and getting their direct feedback into the parole board recruitment process, the vetting process. And so looking over the feedback that I received from Parole Watch, from, from those um, interviews that they've conducted, uh, many of the questions sort of orbit where I was going to be anyway, so I'm going to draw on a few of them and, and I just want to give full credit to where some of these questions are coming from is, is they're coming from that project. Um, also, having said that, a bunch of things I wanted to ask you about have already been asked and so I'm not going to retread, uh, but I very much appreciate the questions of my, my counselor colleagues because they really have, have dove right in on, on things that I think are so important. Um, let me start with uh, this question. So the question that came directly from Pearl Watch, I'm going to add to it, but 
do you believe that one can be rehabilitated in prison is the question that they offered. Um, and for me, just specifically, um, either what programs or what experiences do you think are the most effective and important foundational experiences to promote rehabilitation from the experiences that you've had? I think you can see many examples in the room today and um, with Mr. Coleman's testimony this afternoon that um, absolutely there is that possibility. I think what is unique about the program at NCI Norfolk that was developed and expanded to other prisons is that it was built by people that were incarcerated. So it's built by people that understand what they need and that that is why it has been so effective and it's been tremendously healing. I've been doing this work for a very long time in terms of trying to navigate healing modalities for folks and when when mr I came, when, and mr coleman came into my youth group four years ago and started doing restorative justice circles that they had developed when they were both in norfolk together it was like 10 years of therapy in um in a six-week period of time that they worked with our young people i could really see the shifts and it wasn't only the shifts within the young people it was the shifts within myself it's healing to everyone that sits in that space and i think it needs to be replicated throughout the entire system because i do think that is one of the, the more effective programs that i've seen doing this work wonderful thank you um another question generated by the poll watch project um so just thinking about uh, the experiences you have had um, and projecting to what what cases are going to come before you, individual cases that you're likely to see as a pro board member, do you feel that you can be open minded to all petitioners? Do you feel like you're bringing any personal bias that might impact in any way a particular type of case or particular type of person? I think to answer the first part of the question, yes. Um, I think we all have personal biases and I work out a lot of that in my own clinical supervision and my own therapy services to work out what's my stuff versus what um, what is another person's and what's coming up for me. We're all humans and we interact with biases. And I think to say that I don't have bias would be, um, I, I mean, just not, not human. Um, so of course that comes up, but I think it's my responsibility to work out what that is and, and work through that on my own. I think that awareness is so important and I appreciate that you have it. Um, two more things I wanted to talk about. One is we talked about it briefly when we were, uh, when we met um, and I, I alluded to it earlier uh, in some of my questioning, but the systemic disconnect that seems to be occurring between DOC and parole board expectations, what's happening in the prisons versus what parole board is expecting to see show up where there doesn't appear to be communication between those two entities. Um, add to that the two different softwares doing the risk assessments that are based on different factors and coming out with different conclusions, <laughs> it sounds like. Can you speak to it and your perception of it? And even more importantly to me, do you see yourself being a change agent about it. I would love to be able to be a change agent. I think there's so many challenges between when two systems are trying to do work and not communicating with one another. I think we can oftentimes see parole set conditions of somebody to do restorative justice practices because they know it's so effective, but they're setting that condition with a person who's in a facility that doesn't have restorative justice practices. Exactly. And so to give somebody a two year setup with a condition that doesn't exist is really a setup. And so I think we need to have communication between the DOC and parole so that we're setting conditions that are actually feasible and actually attainable. Agreed. I think that's exactly what needs to happen. Um, so my next is is something that um, having I've, I've gone and observed a few life life for hearings the parole board um, again spoken to people who are incarcerated who've experienced their own hearings, and what strikes me is a focus that seems to happen on the governing offense, like a relitigation of the original crime, rather than, to me, what, what, and I, I'm, I'm new to this council, I'm getting into this work, but my understanding and perception of what parole should be about is from the moment you're incarcerated, who you've been, how you've shown up, the work you've done, and your risk for reoffending um, if given parole. Can you speak to that, that and, and your thoughts on it? And, and again, from a change agent standpoint, if there's something that you think you can bring to it to shift that. 
Absolutely, and I wholeheartedly agree with your understanding of sort of what's happened and the challenges in that. The role of parole, as I understand it, is not to relitigate. It's that's the legislature has set the crime that people have done their time for that. It's to determine whether or not they're safe in community, and so that would be my focus if I'm if I move forward. I'm really look at the individual pieces, factor in community safety, and whether or not our society is better off with them in it or not. That's all the questions I have today. I just want to say it's been really a pleasure getting to know you and and I think you know your experience is exactly what we need on the parole board. Having having said that, I will close with as much I do think you're fantastic. I wish you were fantastic and from Western Mass, because I really think we need to have a, we need to have a voice from Western Mass. We've got unique issues in Western Mass, and I'd love to see someone just as wonderful as you. Um, representing uh, the community issues we struggle with in my part of the state. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Joseph Barrera. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you uh, for calling me the other day and for speaking with me. Um, I can't imagine anyone with a better resume than you. It looks like every day of your life you spent um, helping other people, which is phenomenal in a myriad of ways um, from Blind through the JRI and we are today and all the hospitals and um, the world will be a better place with more people like you. So you have my vote next week. Um, but I was a cop for 30 years. In my last life, I was a police chief. Um, on my way here, I went to Middleborough and I spoke to 50 police chiefs and the state police guys and told them what we do and how we do it. And uh, you know, they all have concerns. So I think I think everyone in this room and everyone in that room wants public safety. They want to know that we're letting good people out and keeping bad people in. And how do you how do you make sure that, you know, how do you do your best to make sure that we don't have, you know, the Jack McGuire killed the day after Christmas in 2010 by a guy that just got out of jail on his last day of duty? How, how do we how do we try to avoid that? Well, and I appreciate that question as well. Um, I worked in the police station for almost three and a half years um, prior to moving over to public health um, with the hospital and have a great value for um, for public safety as well. Um, and I think it's all about individual assessments to really having clinicians on the parole board that can really understand risk. I think these risk assessment tools are often very inade inadequate and ineffective and to determine somebody's risk. Oftentimes we evaluate on, on a motion or something that, that feels like it, it's a, a public safety initiative, but it may not necessarily be in reality. So really having clinicians be able to determine um, and look at a person and the whole complexities of it. When I get these files from attorneys and I'm doing aid and sentencing evaluations, there's not a word that I don't read. I go through everything with a fine tooth comb and make very intentional decisions. Um, and I look forward to being able to work in a, in a team to be able to do that, to ensure that the folks that we're putting out not only are ready to be out in the community, but have the supports that they need to be able to be successful in community. Do you think the parole board has Put some things in place that are better in the last 13 years since that happened. You know, are you aware of what they, the mechanism they use currently? Um, in terms of deciding who's going to get released and who's not. Um, I'm not sure. I, I have a lot to learn in terms of what the processes and decision making practices are currently. Um, but I look forward to learning more about what that. What what tools that they use, and then offering other tools that I use. I'm thinking about what services are um, necessary or needed for each individual that that comes before me as I'm doing reentry plans. You think the state ought to be uni unified so that whether you do time in Martha's Vineyard or Bristol County or in Western Mass or state time that we're using the best programs throughout the entire system? Absolutely. And how do we accomplish that? Absolutely. I think it's it's resource allocation and having centralized um, work to understand what are the programs that have been effective? What are the people that have been coming in front of the parole boards that have really been successful? What programs have they um, gone through and how can we replicate that across the state with with support financially to be able to do that? Excellent. Um, as we, we spoke earlier, I told you my daughter has a master's in public health and is in charge of equity and community health for a large hospital group. and. Uh, she appreciates the fact that you look that you uh, offered to speak with her. She's very excited about that. So, so thank you. you my vote next week. I appreciate all your service. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor. Councilor Marilyn Devaney. 
Thanks to see you again. Uh, before I'm tagged, I just want to say that uh, the council voted for commutation for someone 52 years in prison, and his fiance is here, and I want to recognize her. <laughs> Thank you for meeting with me. I know it was busy and it was fast. And I have, to, I have to tell people, this is so incredible. You talk about small world. You live in Dorchester. And I said, gee, do you have trouble finding the diner? And you said, I grew up in Watertown. She grew up in my hometown. So what a small world. But, and her mom and dad were teachers and very well respected. So, um, you know, where do I go? They're gonna they cut me off if I ever go through all of your, you know, your work, your professionalism, and everything. It's just amazing. And um, one of the things I noticed too, you were director of in Charlestown of uh, the coalition. It was about substance abuse. And I don't know if people know, but I have gone to those drug graduations. They have drug graduations. They have this program that people who are drug addicted, some for years and years, some of them are really older, and they go through this program, and I'm in the back with tears in my eyes, I mean, to see these people successfully going on with their lives, going through this program, and you were the director. Good for you. But the other thing is that we did mention all your publications, which is amazing, about marijuana and all of that. So uh, I'm going to ask that about uh, drug abuse uh, in, in your knowledge and what you've been involved in. Uh, there's just not enough time. They're going to cut me off. They, they made a rule to time, which I voted no. But anyway, okay. <laughs> um, all right. So um, you obviously are not the average social worker, and uh, you've done everything. And um, tell us about, yeah, because I have to say, I'm not politically correct. The last person on the parole board, they're all wonderful, the other three. I voted against him. He never went to a parole board here. Now I'm going to ask you, what was your experience? You go to the uh, parole board hearings all the time. Tell me your experience and what you've learned. Um, my role within currently within the parole board is to meet with, I usually am hired by an attorney. Um, or through the transformational prison problems. Yes. And I've been meeting with people prior, like months prior, six or six or eight months prior to parole to help them prep, to understand their stories, to understand what actual services would be helpful for them to re-enter the community. My role has been mostly around re-entry planning. So thinking about what are the individual needs of this person and then what, it, what can be helpful for them in the community. Some of the resources that have been incredibly helpful that I've tapped into recently have been through the Transformational Prison Project because it's all run by people that have done significant amount of prison time. And there's the programs that exist in the community oftentimes don't understand what it's like for a child to live in the world as a 50 year old man for the first time as an adult ever. And what that's like to have to navigate relationships and work and public transportation and going to a grocery store for the first time. It's completely overwhelming to the psyche. Humans are not meant for captivity. And so when we put people in captivity, especially as children, we're going to see all sorts of challenges. And so even the, the folks like Mr. Kuntz, who has had no tickets, like Mr. Um, Shabazz and, and his wife, who have had, had ex amazing, you know, like out almost unfathomable um, times in, in prison without having to, to um, have any disciplinary reports, still struggle in the community because it's, it's overwhelming. And so the having a network of folks in here, um, yard time and, um, and all sorts of programs that are run by formerly incarcerated people that understand what that's like. Because I even as a clinician, as experienced as I am, I have no idea what it feels like to go into a grocery store and try to make a decision when you haven't been able to make a decision for 50 years. So I think those kind of um, resources are really important um, for folks coming out. And so a lot of my work has been developing reentry plans that are specific to those needs and the safety net when they come out. Mental health services are typically one hour a week for 50 minute session billed by insurance. When people come out, they have to get their insurance activated. They may not have identification. They don't have transportation to get to an appointment. There's so many things that are barriers to accessing 
quality mental health services. That's why we formed the um, wellness center over at the Transformational Prison Project, because when folks come out, they can call me every single day. The folks that um, Attorney Foley was was speaking of, I talk to every day. Mr. Um, Shabazz, I talk to him every day that he comes out. And so it's um, it's being able to have that community and support um, for folks that are that are coming out. We, we talked a lot about um, incarceration. Um, I'm full time, so I go out to prisons and I go to these different programs and pro what you know you more about this so much. And um, we talked about this, and I, I want you to tell us uh, what you see when you have gone out and you've done it for years. What kind of changes do you think we should be making in in, in the prisons? Talk about a fifteen minute. Okay, you know, that left out. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a lot of challenges, I think, um, especially as as I'm speaking of that humans aren't made for captivity with solitary confinement, which, you know, the wording is different now, but having to, to live in isolation is really um, is a huge challenge in terms of coming out and navigating relationships and navigating um, world. It, it can be really, really difficult for folks. Um, I think, I mean, the question is, what are the challenges within the, the prison system? I think classification is a huge challenge. When people get classed to a maximum security prison and then are expected, like our, our shared client, after 48 years in a maximum security prison to adjust to community without any step down opportunities because of the classification report. Um, so really understanding are people classed where they where they need to be. Um, I don't know what parole has in terms of like um, power over that, but I think opportunities to collaborate between the DOC and parole would be a really good start to understand like what, what can we be doing during that time to help people re-enter into that society in a safer way. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we talked about drug addiction and we have certainly lost the war on drugs. And um, I have lost two friends of mine and have lost their sons. And then our friends, they say that you're addicted to drugs time. You take it, but now your involvement in drug addiction. Tell us about that experience, and also uh, your position on marijuana. You want to talk? Let's talk about that too. Sure. Um, I've done the majority of my career has been worked with people with um, on the spectrum of substance use disorder. So people with young teenagers with experimental use, and I've run um, alternative to suspension programming over at Boston Public Schools for chronic marijuana use. I think kids, when you look at marijuana use specifically, um, it's oftentimes a means of a solution to a problem, not necessarily the problem in and of itself. Because you're understanding what that underlying issue is, you want to be outside of themselves. Um, and really looking at understanding the why before we try to remove something from a teenager that may be working for them in some capacity, thinking about what that is and replacing it with something else before we take something away that works. Um, in terms of the more, um, the other the spectrum of substance use disorder, I've worked with people with severe opioid use disorder during COVID and in Charlestown, we've lost 75 lives um, overdoses during that period of time. We had to think really creatively about getting um, services in place for, for folks. I have a recovery coach that um, works with me and runs my addictions programming and um, with lived experience because she's been there and understands what, noticing that AA was medicine for people and took that away from folks during COVID. And so we were seeing an influx of, of overdoses. So we had to put out outdoor tents and we were doing all sorts of innovative work to try to get people to build community in the safest way. <laughs> I think we were in the midst of a national pandemic, but at the same time, that was people's medicine, and they would rather take the risk of getting COVID than to um, than to, to have their medicine withheld withheld from them. So I think when we think about alternatives, it's always thinking outside the box. Our system, always, our, especially as we've looked at addiction, it's never been set up to treat it as a chronic condition. It's really been treated episodically and punitively. And understanding it as a, as as what it is, we can get more effective programs. Um, uh, you, you've worked in so much capacity. We don't see pages like this for some of the <laughs> It's amazing. Uh, so you work from the police to McLean's. Now, in all of your experience, it, and this is hard, I know, for the answer, but is there, can you zero in on one of your professional uh, services that you have done that really, um, you know, really qualifies you to be a parole, to be on the parole board? I think it's the work I'm doing right now and in work with people that are with lived experience, both with an addiction. I've always looked at, I've learned more from folks that struggle with addiction themselves than I have from the 
world renowned doctors that I work with at Mass General Hospital. Um, I work with some of the brightest board certified addiction physicians in the country, and I've learned more experience. And the same thing when I look at reentry and look at healing. And with the work of the, the Restorative Justice and Transformation Prison Project, it's not only healing for young people, but it's also been healing for myself. And so to really look at that. I think it's the work that I'm that I'm doing now. Is the uh, hopefully this. No, it, it's uh, it's just amazing that the that, I mean what, what you're bringing to the parole board, and uh, we have a wonderful three of them up there. Tina is wonderful, and I mean uh, I, they're they're over the moon. You're coming in. I got to tell you that much. But the thing is that um, it, you know with all of this now you you talked about marijuana. And you talked about how. What what is happening now? The drugs that they're putting things in drugs now, and 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 young people are dying. Um, I mean, you don't have to answer that. You, you can't answer it. So I'm gonna let that go. But um, your publications are amazing that you've got involved in that. What do you think is the most important publication? Because I'm I'm gonna run out of time. I think you tell me. I think working with this um, or with a national organization called Smart Decarceration. So I was nominated as a social worker to work in there. It's Smart Decarceration and Ending Racism. And I published an article with with brilliant minds from all over the country on looking at marijuana policy and how it is still impacting uh, people in power. So when we look at social equity programs, is it really helping those that really were affected by the war on drugs? And so it's still, we're seeing the impacts of the, the racist drug policies that have been historically and the ways that we're legalizing and mitigating all of that are still benefiting people with the same status quo of, of people in, in positions of power. And so how we can look at the, the article is really looking at how do we look at um, reform and, and legalization that's actually going to rectify the wrongs that were done? And those experience and who are most impacted by the ridiculous punitive sanctions of marijuana. Marijuana is still in, in 2023 categorized as a Schedule One drug. It's outrageous and that is intentional. And so when we look at that and what the trickle down policies of that are, I'm saying. They are at a risk of losing their housing. They cannot have medicinal use because they follow federal law, not state law. They can live right next to a young person, go to the same school system, and that person can grow 12 plants in their house. The laws are completely inequitable, and we really have to look at that and look at who's benefiting off of the legalization of marijuana. So you know, the other thing is it's not talked about, and I met with some black men from Roxbury who were incarcerated. Uh, people don't realize how hard it is for them to get housing to rent an apartment, all of that. There's so much that people don't know. But um, uh, the other thing is I want you to know that um, I'm I'm full-time counselor, so I meet with everyone, over a thousand people with the judge. I don't know where you are, maybe a thousand too. But I gotta tell you, you are now on the Belgian Waffle Hall of Fame with Kim Butt <laughs> and others. But I, I, that was, I, you can't believe her schedule. I, I can't even imagine how you you we fit that in, but but you did. But um, I, I can't I, I can't thank the governor. And imagine if you lost you. I never seen that before. I mean, they, the governor sends it, but they don't endorse. But they did. So um, we really need you. And as I said, when I first got elected, they were all prosecutors. Hadn't been in conformance since Governor Dukakis. So um, so I've been waiting for someone with your profession, but never never like this. This is unbelievable. So um, I, I'm really so proud. And, and, and to think you're from my hometown, I'm yeah. over the moon. So uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, there's no more questions I could ask you, but um, we, we discussed everything from solitary confinement and everything, just don't have the time, they're gonna cut me off. But um, I love what you do, and you're going to be such a valuable. They're going to have you on as soon as possible. I know they need you. Uh, they're working very hard. They're working, um, you know, for seven people, and, and it's impossible. But um, I, I thank you. I thank the governor for appointing you. I thank you for, you know, even applying. So it was great meeting you. Thanks so much. And I just wanted to say, her parents would have been here. And, and, and so I thought it was a lame excuse they went to London, but <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much. Good afternoon.
You could just speak up a little louder for me because I have a cold and okay. my ears is blocked. Let's assume you're confirmed by this body and now you're conducting a parole hearing. What do you want to hear from that inmate that will say, he's got my vote, I'm going to, I'm going to vote to release him? What's important to you? I think um, many things, but I think um, insight, can they look inward and see um, what, what has transpired? Can they connect the dots a little bit in terms of what has, has taken place? What, is, what, is, um, what do they think they need to be successful in community? What's, um, what's their, what, have they, what have they done during the time in custody? What does that look like and why? Uh, what programmings have they had the opportunity to engage in? What readings have they done on their own? What um, what interests are they? Who they are as a person? I think really to looking at somebody and understanding the, the complexities of who somebody is and what experiences they've had in childhood, what experiences they've had institutionally, and then what is their plan for returning home? And factoring all of those factors in to get together and seeing, you know, is this person somebody that's going to be safe in community? And you didn't say you would hope that the inmate took responsibility for the crime. I'm curious as to your thoughts on that. It's not, I think there are oftentimes, that's been a historic uh, requirement. Again, I'm sorry. It's almost been a requirement for folks to be able to take personal responsibility for acts. And I think there's oftentimes issues related to um, joint venture, there's issues related to, there are some people that are not, that didn't actually commit the, the crime in there either, that um, I think we need to really understand that that is not, I don't think that's the sole factor of whether or not somebody would be safe in community. Um, I think there are a multitude of factors that come in, whether somebody has the capacity for empathy is huge, whether they can understand the gravity of, of the impact of their behaviors, absolutely, whether or not they can, but I think to focus solely on, um, that one issue is not indicative of the whole picture. I totally agree. I mean, because I think I read a study, 10, 15% of the people in prison didn't commit the crime. Uh, but before I came here, I looked at the guidelines for previous governors. I've been fortunate enough to be on here since Governor Mike Dukakis. And if you look at those clemency guidelines, a lot of the previous governors had a requirement uh, that the inmate had to acknowledge uh, what he did was wrong and take responsibility. But, you know, uh, people make mistakes. These judges, juries, they make mistakes. So I'm really glad and I appreciate that answer. Another thing over the years that I've noticed, you know, from talking to parole board members, too many of these parole uh, folks you want to retry the case. You're not, that's not your job. At least that's my understanding. You're not, you know, and I, I, I don't like when the uh, parole, parole board members question uh, the inmate about what happened, what about this, the facts in the case. That's at least my, my, my sense of it. What's yours? I very much agree. Um, and I appreciate the question as well. I think it's also very, when we think about the victims in the room and the survivors, I think it's also been, it's re-traumatizing and re reliving for them as well. I think that it's not necessary to go into the details. They've been sentenced on the details. I think what we need to look at now is moving forward, generalize what, what was, you know, what, what happened leading up into here, and then where are we going from here, the, the bulk of the time. Um, I, I, I just don't think it's the right place to be. I totally agree. Is there enough help in these prisons for mental health treatment? So many of these folks need help. Uh, my gut tells me there's not, uh, there should be more treatment. I mean, you know, I've been always a strong advocate of rehabilitation as opposed to incarceration, if possible, under the circumstances. But what's your sense on that? I 1000% agree. The answer is a very hard no that there is not enough treatment inside the walls. And in fact, there's so much stigma around mental health treatment because it's really looked at as more of a public safety measure in terms of like population control than it is healing from actual long term childhood trauma. So it's like, are you actively suicidal? Are you actively homicidal? If the answer is yes to either one of those, it's oftentimes stripped naked 
put into a solitary cell. And, so, and um, oftentimes my clients have let me know that their cells have been searched during that time. So they're really adamant about not engaging in mental health services. There's so much stigma and there's also hasn't been helpful. In fact, it's oftentimes with maybe good intentions, but hasn't caused, um, it's, it can almost be contraindicative in terms of causing more stress and anxiety for folks. And so I think, um, I think there absolutely needs to be more uh, mental health services within. Thank you. Uh, what an amazing resume. You know, I really, I generally really, I really mean that. I mean, too often over the years, we've had too many people in law enforcement. Uh, and, you know, these people may be good people, but we just never had enough people in the social science background. You got, you got, involvement with psychology, uh, I mean, everything, psychiatry. I mean, you are an ideal candidate. Uh, we've had some very good uh, people come before us, but I mean, you're top shelf. You're really, really uh, impressive. Uh, and I see you worked at McLean Hospital. My, uh, my, dog, my daughter graduated a year ago from Harvard College and she's on a path to get her PhD in psychiatry, uh, and she's working at McLean Hospital. And she loves the job. She loves it's. Uh, she's handling uh, dealing with uh, little kids. I figure by you know between five and twelve, and it's challenging. Very challenging. But uh, she loves it. Yeah. She really. Uh, Pay is a great, but she doesn't. Yeah, none, none of them are. <laughs> That's why most social. She really <laughs> loves the job. Uh, no, but it's great to see all these people here today on your behalf. No one in opposition. Uh, I got to tell you, when I put your name before the council at the next assembly, I'm not sure if it's next week, I'm going to be proud and honored to put your name. Like I said, your top shelf, you are going to do an outstanding job and really. Uh, your friends, family, they should be so proud of you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It means a lot. Of well, uh, question. One more quick question. Yeah. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this. I, I served 22 years on the Commission on Disabilities. You have someone before you on the parole board, whether it's Asperger or autism or whatever. How, how do you deal with someone with a disability? I think it's really interesting that person. I have a case right now where I have a, a, a man that's being held awaiting a DDS bed because DDS Joe the, the application unless they have a release date, but parole is won't release him until he has a program. So it's so much because the systems aren't communicating with one another. So I think that's a huge challenge and something I would be really interested in addressing. Thank you, Thank you very much. I will conclude the hearing. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Job count.